Dr. Moran, we are live. Good morning, everyone. We are going live. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Give us just a few seconds so we can have everybody seated. We're getting ready. Okay. Okay. Do you want, would you like me to go ahead and kick it off? <laughs> Let's go. We are ready to start. All right. Good morning, everybody. I think we'll go ahead and get started. I'm Jennifer Smith. I'm the Chief of Staff at the South Florida Water Management District. And I would just like to uh, welcome everyone for being here. Um, I'll, I'll be brief, but um, this is actually our one-year anniversary for this, uh, this forum. This is the, the fifth meeting. And I, I just think that, you know, I would like to think we've all seen so much progress from these meetings. This is, resiliency is critically important to the Water Management District. And I think this kind of effort and collaboration is just, uh, is, is really great. And we've seen a lot of, uh, a lot of fruitfulness from that. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for being here. I'd like to thank Dr. Carolina Moran and her team for putting these together and, and organizing these events. That takes a lot of work, I know that. Um, I'd also like to thank Dr. Wes Brooks for being on the line and their uh, collaboration and um, partnership with, with the Water Management District and the state. Today's agenda looks uh, very robust. I, I'm interested in, in listening in on a lot of these topics, uh, and I hope you all are uh, excited to participate in them. I know that with um, recent events, recent rain events, and king tides you know, coupled together, this is a, a really good timing for this meeting. I know that there will be a lot of discussion about that and just how we can you know, optimize, um, optimize uh, our, our resources here. So um, again, I just want to say we're looking forward to continue, continuing our collaboration with FEMA. That has been uh, worked out really well with us and continuing the participation and partnership with all of the local governments. And, and that's why it's so important and uh, happy that you all are here with us today. So with that, I will turn it over to Carolina. Good morning, Yvette. I think you're going to bring us some housekeeping. Yes, I am. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, participation for this meeting will be in person. This meeting is be also being live streamed. Question and comments will be taken at the appropriate place on the agenda from those present. There will be an opportunity for questions after each presentation. If you have a technical question, please complete section five of the comment card. If you would like to comment, please complete section six of the public comment card and hand it to the meeting attendant. Public comment will be taken during agenda item number 12 from those present in the room. Representatives from local, tribal, and state organizations will have an opportunity to provide agency updates during agenda item 11. Now to you, Dr. Moran. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer, for the opening remarks. And uh, with that, I'm going to ask Dr. Brooks to um, also provide an update on statewide Office of Resilience. Great. Thank you, Carolina. And thank you, Jennifer, for that great welcome. Um, and, and really, what, what a year it has been for these forums, both in terms of the presentations and the engagement that we've seen, as well as the real world events that continue to highlight the need for this high level coordination. As we all know, it's been a wet year in South Florida. And with a strong El Nino in full force, it's likely we'll see a wetter than average dry season. So the work that everyone has been putting in into improving the resilience of our communities and our infrastructure is certainly being tested this year and will continue to be so, at least uh, for the months ahead. No city, I think, has been tested more in the region than Fort Lauderdale. As we know, over 100 inches of rainfall to date this year. You've all seen the pictures and video of cars stalled out and airport runways underwater. And, you know, that makes sense. Flooding problems are obvious. They're attention grabbing. Um, certainly while they're happening. But how many residents in the region are aware that before this rainy season even began, local governments had already accurately assessed flood risks that manifested in April and again earlier this month? 
how many residents are aware that the South Florida Water Management District had already begun assessing changes in extreme rainfall above the historical conditions we uh, come to expect? And how many residents are aware that the state's flagship Resilient Florida program had recently awarded $55 million in grants for 14 projects, leading to what we're expecting to be more than $127 million in infrastructure investments and stormwater and flood protection in the very communities where it later proved necessary. Flooding in South Florida is inevitable and it will always be newsworthy, but our comprehensive and cooperative efforts are going to start paying dividends over the coming years. It's up to us to make sure those stories get told too. So in the spirit of Thanksgiving, I also wanna highlight some of the, the agenda items that certainly deserve more attention. I'm grateful to have Kristen Lentz from DEM here to talk about her and her team's effort on Florida's new enhanced state hazard mitigation plan. I'm appreciative of Megan Houston's efforts to pull together a large group of municipalities from within Palm Beach County on a recent Resilient Florida planning grant application to help facilitate a cooperative and coordinated approach to local vulnerability assessments. And I'm certainly thankful for Dr. Moran and the Army Corps' efforts to continue progress towards the extension of service life and effectiveness of the Central and Southern Florida system through the ongoing feasibility study efforts, where alongside implementation of nature-based features and Everglades restoration, will ensure a flood control system that can sustain South Florida as a thriving region for decades to come. As the calendar turns to December, it's also time to start celebrating the anticipated release of DEP's $300 million statewide resilience plan, along with 20 million in new planning grant awards and 2 million for regional resilience entities that were approved in the state budget this summer by Governor DeSantis and the Florida legislature. Taken together, we're making great strides towards a resilient future, and we just need to keep working together and keep investing today in these resilience efforts that are gonna help us secure South Florida's tomorrow. Thank you very much, and I look forward to all the presentations. Thank you, thank you very much. Let me move to the podium. Okay, so good morning again, everyone. Uh, thank you for all of those who drove um, here this morning. Uh, we are very grateful for your attendance here in person, for the opportunity to discuss with you. We have, as Dr. Brooks uh, pointed out, a very heavy, robust, interesting agenda. So we're gonna try to move as, uh, as we can to make sure we address all those items uh, and have a very um, strong discussion as we need to, pro to progress in some of those um, agenda items. I'm gonna just start by giving um, a brief uh, district resilience updates from our team, from our work that we are doing. So some of the, the major progress that we did since our, we last met about a, qu uh, a quarter, three months ago. So um, if you remember, we had a, an open house uh, last time with uh, the presence of local mitigation and strategy committees. Uh, we were able to get about half of our counties here sitting with us discussing and finding some overlap in planning efforts and coordination efforts between local mitigation strategies and the more recent uh, instruments that we have through Resilient Florida, so vulnerability assessments, identification of priority projects. There is a lot to leverage between those efforts. It was a very great discussion. We talked a little bit about this uh, um, integration of hazard mitigation and resilience adaptation planning and found some of the long-term risk reduction examples. So a lot of efforts already happening at the county level, at some municipality level, at the state level, really kind of advancing the identification of what kind of resilience action, what kind of resilience projects we have out there, how they align and how can we leverage existing resources. It was very good. Um, of course, it happened during the one in the middle of the hurricane season, so exactly during the time that we were having Adalia. So we really wanna go back and revisit this dynamic. I think it, we should invest in one more of those events next year and continue the conversation with the local um, mitigation uh, committees, strategy committees at the local level. We are making good progress. I know our, our uh, strategic affairs team, uh, we have Libby here, the director. Today, they are getting closer and closer to the those local mitigation strategy committees. We are working to get our projects in the plan, all, that, all of those projects also 
um, added to the list. So there is a lot of work. We are making progress and, and continuing to work very closely with our counties and municipalities. So thanks for everybody who joined us last time. Uh, since then, we were able, actually one day after, we were able to uh, finalize and publish the 2023 Sea Level Rise and Resiliency Plan. Uh, and for the first time this year, we also needed to produce this um, consolidated annual report to the governor's, governor's office, to the legislators, uh, to the um, uh, research, um, uh, demographic research, uh, economic and demographic research agency, and to FDP. Uh, so this is basically a summary of what we have in the plan already. All the key projects, how much money, what kind of budget we have already identified for those projects and some of the next steps. Um, and again, we received significant comments. We really appreciate. We had uh, 24 agencies that submitted comments to us. We addressed all of them. We responded to all of them. So we really appreciate the, that contribution too as we continue to develop and continue to to really build this, this resiliency plan effort here with a series of projects being identified year after year. Uh, of course, like most of you all, the grants word is our path to a lot of the projects that we are identifying. I know we are working in a series of those projects in coordination and very closely with you all. We have investing, been investing a lot of our time on that too, so the plan provides the support every year. We continue looking at those priority projects that we identified through the planning process and, and really working on those applications. We had about 20 that we submitted uh, since the, the last uh, um, forum as well. Uh, I have a list here. So we have Resilient Florida, NOAA grants, um, the disaster declaration from Hurricane Ian, so an AJ, AJ, AJMP grant, and the BRIC proposal that we are finalizing uh, today. It's actually due this week. Uh, and of course, we are looking to further explore project partnerships in 2024. A lot of those grant proposals are done in coordination with the local governments, with the counties. We want to continue on that path. There is a lot that we can leverage from this, and we are really discussing already some of those projects and opportunities to partner in 2024. I know we have extensive conversations when we sit down with the counties before we even have the list of, of grants that we will be applying every year to get input to understand um, the, the, some of the priorities from the local level as well. We're gonna have a presentation today from Jenny and team. Thank you for joining us on, the, on this first uh, coordination effort with the Corps, but we are continuing to make progress on the CNSF flood resiliency study. They will talk a little bit about this workshop that, that we hosted uh, in October to help us on identifying some of the performance measures, metrics that we'll be using then uh, to help us identify, to finalize this, this study. And they will also talk a little bit about the new design requirements and what that means for this specific study. Uh, we have been continuing uh, to host uh, in just initial meetings for the comprehensive study that was authorized in WARDA 2022. This is uh, a larger, much larger version of this flood resiliency study, but we are coordinating with the core hosting initial meetings and also sitting down with St. John's River Water Management District as they also um, are gonna be one of the local sponsors. And we, of course, are providing support to the Southeast Florida integration meetings. In addition to those that we are listing here that are mostly focused on resiliency, we have significant efforts, BBC here, uh, the Back Bay, um, other CERP projects, so there is this effort led by Team Guys and Chu on the integration of all those uh, Army Corps studies, so we are providing support as needed to that, and Team will talk a little bit more about it. Uh, we also have a closing of all the wet, hurricane, and king tide season, like getting to an end towards the end of this week. And uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the progress uh, in some of the tools that we have. We have been investing in those tools so we can better understand what's happening, document, use that to support planning, uh, modeling, and really help us to respond better. I think a lot of what we're gonna be discussing here today is gonna be also talking about that. Not only what we can plan to build in the future to enhance the system, but also how can we respond better now by optimizing some of the operations. So. Again, we need this data, we need uh, tools, we need options that allow us to, to have real-time data, communication, and uh, we are investing in a little bit of that. Chris will talk uh, on the progress that we made this year um, on, on those tools specifically. 
Uh, we also launched Kintai Outlook bulletins this year for the first time. We are having enhanced projections with the support from uh, the University of Miami. And we are working with our field staff as well to go to the field and help us document potential impacts from King Tide. So this is a little bit of what we did this year. Uh, we are very grateful to be able to work with the field staff on really helping us to identify some critical conditions that are brought by those King Tides. Uh, the same tools that we are kind of making available to the government, to the local governments, we also train and made available to our field staff through the support from the GIS team. So they are out there. They, it's uh, it's a, a lot more a pair of eyes uh, helping us to understand how the system is behaving. And then, um, of course, as I talk about all of that, I just want to reinforce one more time that coordination is essential. We need you all to kind of embrace those tools, share data with us as much as possible, as quickly as possible. We're going to be investing more and more on that. We have one more, our third level of um, of, this, of making those tools available last year, which would be allowing us to reach out to the public, and we are not going to do ourselves. We're going to ask the, the local governments and the partners to really get use your network, your um, channels that you have in terms of communicating with the public so we can get uh, those those flood information, impacts information. So it's it's we have planned this in a three-step level. We, we build those tools to first train and use inside in-house with our staff. Last year, this year, we made it available to some of the local governments to start using them and collect images. And the next year, we're going to make it available to the public. So we come with your support for that as well. And Chris will talk a little bit more and kind of provide you more details on those tools. Um, one more effort also on this side. Uh, we have been coordinating with the USGS. We have. Um, an agreement under negotiation right now. We understand that we also need some additional support in collecting information. We do not have a very robust network, especially downstream uh, of the coastal structures. In some of the areas that, that we might potentially see some also overland flooding, when we look at our models, I mean, we have water levels over water bodies, mostly really well monitored but in locations where they're usually dry, not as much monitoring and, and a little lack of capacity to understand where the, the extent of those flooding events and things like that. So we are talking with the USGS. They, we have an, a draft agreement in place. They have two technologies. One is the rapid deployment gauge. It's still on top of major water bodies, but it's, uh, it's something that they can uh, rapidly uh, implement and need it when we have a gap in the system. So we identify some areas for this um, initial model. Uh, I'm going to share the list with you all. We need to kind of prioritize some of those areas. That was the last requirement from the USGS in terms of what would be the key critical areas. So it would be very great to have your input so we can finalize those locations. And then an additional sensor is a small flood sensor that they have. They usually stay on dry, like tied to any kind of telephone post or any kind of post that you can tie in. And uh, they are deployed during um, those major events. So with an, some kind of anticipated node, it's not like that's going to be there permanently. They move those, those devices around. But we, again, we have the opportunity to, to partner with them and have them helping us on those flood sensors as well. In those maps, they just show to us where they have been. It's not that they have those gauges all over our coast, but those have been the locations where they have prioritized the installation and the, the, the temporary installation of those uh, gauges in the coast. Again, as I said, mostly in the coastal downstream areas, but we also uh, have the capacity to bring them a little bit further inland as we understand that we need to look at that. So we, we have listed there also some areas in the Upper Kissimmee Basin, for example, as areas that we know we have some gap and we might want to uh, have some of those gorges installed. So we appreciate your input. I'm going to share this, uh, the list with you all and, and ask for feedback before I, uh, we send the priority locations to the USGS. And then my last update, my last slide here on updates, just um, a wrap up of a lot of other actions is just that uh, we have um, uh, some, I would say, significant actions going on, and uh, I don't want to spend a lot of the time. We have a robust agenda, but more briefly, we continue on the coordination with FDEP on the implementation of the grants that we receive. There is 
intense work there on aligning um, the agreements, the budget, all of those pieces. So Nafisa has been doing an incredible job coordinating with FDP and our the internal departments here to get those grants implemented. Uh, we have uh, FPLOS phase one studies fully completed for all basins in Miami now. We, I know last month, last time we met, there was one more added, but now formally all the reports are finalized. So phase one for LOS is fully completed for all Miami Dade and Broward basins at this point. We are working on Palm Beach County and Apricusimi right now, and we just initiated, we kick off about two weeks ago, um, Martin and San Lucie County Phase 1 FPLOS. We were very excited. This is another big project that we are initiating there. Um, water and climate resilience metrics updates. We continue to invest on those metrics. We have um, finalized the automation of some of the ones that still pending, mostly from the uh, water quality side. Uh, we also did some redesign of the hub just to make the portal a little bit more user friendly. And we have completed the scientific reports for this year, so all the data analysis that we are adding to the hub are coming with this additional reporting through the South Florida Environmental Report. So we have two chapters there. Uh, it went out for the public comments. We are addressing those public comments right now as well. We have uh, drought projections under development. This is a partnership with USGS and FIU. Uh, this is the same team that has been helping us on understanding extreme rainfall. We are now, we turn now and we are focusing on the extreme dry events using the same databases that we have had used in the past. Um, and they have made uh, incredible progress. We have a very robust assessment that we're gonna get out um, sooner than later. And uh, this is going to support our water supply vulnerability assessment. This study will start March next year, as soon as we complete all the runs and the, um, the reporting for the Lower East Coast uh, water supply plan. The team can then uh, switch gears and, and run those additional scenarios using the same models and the same tools that are going to be used to the Lower East Coast plan, but looking at a further in time. Uh, horizon and really, uh, I mean, understanding some of those additional vulnerabilities, so sea level rise and climate, like really evaporation and rainfall being fully modeled and understanding how we can read those vulnerabilities. And finally, the last item here is collaboration with the Florida Flood Hub, the statewide office of resiliency. We have been working on expanding the rainfall projections that we did here for South Florida to the whole state. Uh, we are finalizing the discussions there. We already have the numbers published in a website, the data release portal from USGS. So uh, if anybody for any reason outside of South Florida needs this data, we can point to where it is uh, right now. The South Florida data is, again, the same data sets and we have in our resilience metrics hub. It's out there. And we're gonna add, of course, the drought projections to the same hub. and. Um, so we are just getting all those information out there and expanding statewide. And from the flood risk modeling aspect, this is also um, um, a role that is under the resiliency, uh, so, sorry, under the Florida Flood Hub. We are also responsible to, to delineate, to indicate an approach for us to be able to do those flood risk uh, assessments uh, in a, on a state level. We have, we, we're gonna kick off a uh, collaboration through all five water management districts and um, uh, through the Silver Jackets program, so it's all five water management districts, the, the Florida Flood Hub, and we're gonna be doing a, an assessment of existing modeling tools. So that's the first step with the support of the Silver Jackets. We're gonna get out and understand what kind of models we have statewide, which areas are mapped, which areas are not, we don't have any model, and how we can understand gaps that we have in terms of assessing flood risk uh, statewide. With that, um, thank you. Um, I, don't, I usually don't open this for questions. If anybody has any comment or question, I'll be happy to take. If not, I'm gonna transition to Rachel. Uh, thank you, Rachel, very much uh, for joining us. Uh, I know we had a, a last minute uh, conflict and you couldn't be here in person, so you're gonna be joining us virtual today. But she's the acting director for community and resilience coordination with FEMA. And she's gonna be talking with us a little bit on the community disaster resiliency zones. This is something new that came, fairly new that uh, FEMA recently released. Those are gonna be used for some of their programs. So we wanna understand a little bit better. I know a lot of the counties were having questions. I was 
kind of involved in a few of those discussions. So we want to understand a little bit more what do they mean, how FEMA will be using that, and, and, and also how those community disaster resilience zones were, were determined. So we really welcome uh, Rachel here. Thank you very much for making time for us to talk a little bit about that. And uh, I'll turn this to you, Rachel. Great, thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. And thank you, um, sorry. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm very sorry I was not able to travel to Florida to meet you all in person, but I am happy to be able to join you virtually um, and share some information on FEMA's new Community Disaster Resilience Zones Initiative, um, other, otherwise known as CEDARS. Um, as was mentioned, I am the acting director for FEMA's new Community Resilience Coordination Division. Uh, this division was stood up to help better improve the coordination across FEMA programs and with our interagency partners across the federal government to improve the way that we deliver technical assistance and grants and, and different programs to help communities build resilience. And next slide, please. I'd like to begin by providing a brief overview of CEDARS. Um, I'm sure that by this point, many of you have heard something about CEDARS, so I don't wanna dive too deep into some of the background, but I do wanna be able to provide some context and share a little bit about the initial designations, the benefits for those designated zones and where we see this program going into the future. Next slide. Next slide. Um, so the Community Disaster Resilience Zones Act was signed by President Biden on December 20th of 2022. Um, and was supported by nearly 30 organizations, as well as having bipartisan support in Congress. Um, and since it was approved, or since it was signed into law, it has uh, several organizations have signaled additional support um, and continue to support that as we roll out these designations. So just a little bit of background on the legislation itself. Um, the Community Disaster Resilience Zones Act of 2022 actually amended Title II of the Robert T. Stafford Disaster Relief and Emergency Act, or the Stafford Act, as many know it, um, by adding Section 206. This amendment requires FEMA to have a risk assessment system it also requires FEMA to seek input from other federal agencies and the public on developing a methodology within that risk assessment system to designate community disaster resilience zones based on relative risk ratings and to repeat this public engagement process uh, and the methodology and redesignate zones every five years. In addition, the amendment to the Stafford Act gives FEMA three discretionary authorities for activities that are within or are primarily benefiting community disaster resilience zones. Um, first of all, it increases the federal cost share to not more than 90% for uh, brick or building resilient infrastructure and in communities mitigation projects, beginning with fiscal year 2023 brick grants, uh, which are the, no the notice of funding opportunity is currently open for. Uh, it also enables FEMA to provide financial, technical, or other assistance to communities to carry out activities in preparation for a resilience or mitigation project within a uh, designated zone. Um, and this funding will come from a set aside within the BRIC program. And finally, it uh, allows for FEMA to establish an application process to provide a FEMA certification for mitigation or resilience projects. The project certification is intended to help drive resilience investments from other federal agencies, from nonprofits, from philanthropic organizations, and from other private investments that may uh, exist within CEDARS designated areas. Um, this is something that we're continuing to explore and will be refining into the future. So it hasn't been fully developed yet. Next slide, please. Um, so community disaster resilience zones have the potential to be a vital tool in helping FEMA and other federal agencies, as well as community organizations and philanthropic organizations and the private sector to focus resilience and mitigation efforts um, and help communities really build out, understand and build out their resilience. Through this initiative, uh, our vision is to help support the resilience of our most at-risk areas in the face of a changing world leveraging FEMA's extensive partnership network uh, in support of the designated zones and using this program as a model to drive public-private partnerships so the value add to critical resilience is greater than the sum of its parts. A couple of the key cross-cutting principles, um, we see this as a partnerships-driven approach to support our most at-risk communities 
The partnerships forged in this program are potentially groundbreaking and represent an innovative model for future designations. As, as far as outcomes, we expect the investments made in these communities to be rock solid, both in terms of their financial viability, but also their resilience value adds. And we hope that this process can be self-reinforcing, whereby designated zones benefit from the funding and technical expertise of our partners, therefore enhancing the knowledge of our resilience network, which in turn will drive better outcomes for communities. Next slide. Next slide. Oh, there you go. Um, so as I mentioned, this designate uh, this legislation was approved uh, at the end of 2022, and since then, FEMA has been working uh, through a multi-phased approach to identify and establish this initiative. Um, earlier this year, our teams worked to develop and finalize a methodology in conjunction with our federal partners, uh, as well as based on the input of hundreds of comments that were received through a federal register notice request for information. Uh, in September, we announced an initial cohort of 483 designation, designated areas, and uh, we are currently in phase three where we are focusing on both finalizing the methodology for our tribal and territorial designations, which we expect to release soon, and engaging with external stakeholders to understand opportunities for them to support the CEDARS initiative. Finally, once we have designations uh, completed and the methodology um, in place, we will work to develop an assessment of the CEDARS initiative to, for ongoing monitoring and evaluation. We hope that this project will meet the high standards that we have for it, and our evaluation methodology is intended to be data-driven and focus on the impact that this program can have on the communities who most need the support. Next slide. So for the first round of designations, um, as I mentioned in September, FEMA announced the first 483 community disaster resilience zones. Um, these are across all 50 states uh, in the District of Columbia. We are still working on finalizing the methodology for tribal and territorial areas because they have some unique nuances that we wanna make sure are captured in the methodology. So for this first round of designations, we select for states, we selected the census tracts uh, within the national risk index scores that rank in the top 50 nationally or in the top 1% in each state. And after selecting census tracts according to risk, we then use the climate and economic justice screening tool created by the White House Council on Environmental Quality to remove any census tracts that was not designated as disadvantaged. Um, so every census tract designated as a CEDARS is classified as disadvantaged. Then all of the designations underwent peer review by subject matter experts in a methodology data working group uh, that was supported by federal interagency partners that are part of the mitigation framework leadership group. The methodology resulted in this designation of 483 census tracts uh, with at least one in each of the 50 states and the District of Columbia. Next slide. So one more slide. The, uh, it's going backwards. Um, so the next slide is going to show you a map. There we go. The map. Uh, thank you. The map of the Technical. designated areas. Um, so the, it's a little hard to see on this map. So I'm going to encourage everyone to go to FEMA's website uh, on community disaster resilience zones, which has a GIS application where you can actually zoom in and really get more details on where exactly these census tracts are. But as you can see um, from those little teal dots across the, the country, um, these are all of the designated areas that have already been designated. Uh, because these are census tracts, they vary significantly based on size. Some are hundreds of miles wide, while others are roughly a couple of blocks. Um, our goal in this was to, was to achieve geographical balance in our designations, ensuring that each state has at least one designated zone that met the criteria. Uh, next slide. And then this slide gives you a little bit of an opportunity to see uh, for the Florida area where how the breakdown of CEDARS designated areas fell for the state of Florida. Um, again, if you go into the um, website page, you can have a much deeper view and really zone in on exactly where those designated areas are. Um, but the table on the left also shows bro it broken down by counties. Next slide. 
Just as a little bit of additional detail and stats about our community disaster resilience zones, um, Cedars areas represent about 2 million people, approximately equal to 0.6% of the national population. 76% um, of designated zones face three or more hazards that are rated high, relatively high or very high in the National Risk Index. 84% of designated zones have high social vulnerability ratings. And cedars have approximately seven and a half times higher annual expected losses than non cedars. Um, finally, about 36% of designated zones are in large metro areas, and 37% are in rural areas. So, next slide. Now that I've covered a little bit about how the current designations and how we've uh, came to that those identifications, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about what's next and the direction that cedars is heading. Uh, we know that there are many incredible partners, including nonprofits and foundations that are interested in working with FEMA and with communities, um, with these communities to help make this uh, a success and really use this tool to the best of its ability. Next slide. So our vision is for whole community support beyond FEMA. Um, this is an opportunity for partner organizations that are better in touch with the specific needs of communities to use that knowledge and familiarity to help design community-centered support. We understand that at the federal level, we don't always know these communities as intimately as many of our partners. And so this is an opportunity to really leverage that understanding and knowledge in those local areas. Designated zones will have the opportunity to expand their resilience networks, leveraging some of the partner networks that we will be working to, to establish and support. This program provides opportunities for communities to work with existing partnerships, as well as forging new connections with organizations that they otherwise may not have run across, and to expand the types of technical assistance and types of projects that they have access to. The figure on the left shows our vision for a broad-based public-private coalition of support for these designated areas. Each of these contributors is essential to the initiative's success. The public sector, including federal agencies and state, local, tribal, and territorial governments, private nonprofits, philanthropic organizations, and the private sector. The call box on the right lists just some of the many functions and activities the organizations in the public-private partnership coalition will play. Next slide. We also hope to work together in new ways with private sector organizations to provide assistance to the designated communities. Community disaster resilience zones will be able to leverage public-private network for resilience-based projects, and stakeholder networks will have increased awareness of local needs through their work with them. CEDARS, will have act CEDARS designated areas will have access to both partners with technical and community assistance for their resilience projects. Um, really leveraging and focusing in on those local partners and their understanding of the needs um, much better than we have at the federal government. Next slide. Um, as far as some of the immediate benefits, I, I mentioned this uh, initially regarding the legislation, but just to reiterate, immediately and most concretely, a community disaster resilience zone designation allows for increases to the federal cost share for building resilient infrastructure and communities funded mitigation projects that are within and or that primarily benefit a designated community disaster resilience zone. The goal here is to lessen the financial burden on communities pursuing resilience related activities. This increased cost share is included in the notice of funding opportunity that was for BRIC, which was issued in early October and is open until the end of February. Communities with designated census tracts, if interested, will also receive prioritization for BRIC techni direct technical assistance, which provides tailored support to communities that may not have the resources to begin climate resilience planning and project solutions on their own. The BRIC application period um, opened in mid-October and it closes on February 29th of 2024. So there's still plenty of time to think about and uh, put together project proposals for that. In addition, FEMA is also publishing a new form to streamline and simplify the request submission process. Uh, and all of the details of that are included in the notice of funding opportunity, which is posted on FEMA's website. Uh, when, when communities are ready to come in with a BRIC project application, that is located in or primarily benefits a CEDARS area, um, they, can receive, they can also receive an additional 40 points in scoring, which provides even more opportunities to help support those zones. 
In addition to the BRIC, the benefits under the BRIC program for the flood mitigation assistance uh, applicants, they will also similarly receive additional points on their applications, as well as benefit cost analysis technical assistance. Um, and so, as I mentioned, both of those notice of funding opportunities are currently uh, listed on the FEMA website and have all of the details on, on exactly how that is intended to work and play out. Next slide. Finally, in addition to the benefits that FEMA programs uh, can provide with regards to the CEDARS designated areas, we are excited that a number of our fellow federal agencies have also identified opportunities and commitments to provide support to these areas. Um, these range from climate to economic development and resilience and rural partnerships. Designated zones will have a wide range of potential federal support structures to leverage as outlined on this slide here. Um, we have a number of untapped partnerships and expect to continue to build and expand our interagency partnerships as additional um, designations are announced in the future, uh, but also as we continue to build and engage across that network. Across that network. So we are excited uh, that there will be much more to come on this in the future. Next slide. Um, so to the extent time allows, I'm happy to take any questions, but I'm also happy to just take any questions as follow up. Uh, feel free to send me an email or um, as you'll see on the, the final slide, um, there's an email address to send any uh, broad questions to the CEDARS team and, and we can make sure that we get those answered uh, as quickly as possible. But otherwise, thank you so much for the opportunity uh, to brief here and uh, I appreciate the, the opportunity to talk with all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel. I'm going to go around the room to see if anybody has a question. I have one myself, but I'm going to let you all come first if you have. Thanks, Carolina. And uh, thank you. I'm sorry. The presenter's name was Rachel. Rachel thank you. Uh, I'm Jim Early. I'm the chief resilience officer in Miami-Dade. And while you were talking, uh, I was sitting with my emergency management partner and we were looking at the map and one of the zones is really interesting it's kind of mostly the everglades uh and the very far western part of our county i even think some of it is miccosukee tribal so i i just i think it's one we could all look at you know with it with the park because it's it's going to be the park and and maybe uh eight and a half square miles i'm not sure it's a in, interesting if you looked at it on the map. That was exactly my question that I was going to ask. Rachel, you did mention 37% being more rural areas, but this is like a national protected park area. I don't yeah. know how you classify it, but there is very little. I think there's some of Chrome. Yeah. I mean, this is very specific to our county, and we'll work with the district. And luckily, we have a, we have a lot of FEMA help. So, uh, But I think that'll be an interesting one to test uh the other two in our county were kind of self-evident i guess there are three but you know but we're excited to work on them thanks thank you do you know rachel if any kind of maybe natural area criteria was used also to prioritize those disaster resiliency zones yeah so it's a it's a great question and i appreciate you flagging that i think one of the um you know, when we use a national level data set to try and uh, narrow down these these local areas, one of the challenges is is just looking at high level data. And so uh, I believe, and I, I can get more details on specifically what the factors were for that area, but um, I think when it comes to things like that, it's really that the, um, the hazards that could potentially impact that area just very much outweighed some of the other criteria and so it tipped the balance in favor of designating that um we will continue um our, our goal is to continue to refine that methodology into the future so that we can make sure that we are um getting the designations to the areas most in need of that um i again because it's a high level sort of map it would probably be good to look more specifically at exactly which area was designated and, and how much of the population might be impacted near that area uh, and maybe it just includes because because that census track is more uh, less densely populated rather um, perhaps that's why it was designated but I'd have to dive into it specifically I think it's just one of those um, tricky parts of using a national level data set to try and 
uh, capture the nuances of each individual state. So we'll definitely take that back for uh, as we continue to revi refine both the National Risk Index data sets and the methodology for this. Um, and happy to talk offline about specifics for how we can help structure, um, you know, with the, the BRIC program and other things to support those areas. Perfect. Thank you, Rachel. Anybody else? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Carolina. Hello, Rachel. My name is Jackie May. I'm the grants administrator with the city of Stewart in Martin County, and we have the dubious distinction of being designated our county's only Cedars entity. I'm curious to know, if we were to visit the website, will we find more detail about how our community was ranked and what criteria were identified? So the website will uh, give you some additional information on exactly, you know, the specific areas that were designated. Um, we didn't, I wouldn't necessarily refer to it as ranking because we didn't really rank one cedars above another or issue anything that um, highlighted one being more vulnerable than a different area. Um, but if there are specific questions about the, some of the factors that go into it, I would encourage you to send an email to that um, to that email address that I put on the, the final slide, uh, and they can send you a more specific breakdown of where, uh, what some of those criteria within the CJEF tool, as well as within the National Risk Index, uh, were that highlighted uh, your county or your er that area within your county um, as a designated CEDARS. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. I just wanted, <clears throat> sorry, I just wanted to add really quick, this is Kristen Lenz from the Florida Division of Emergency Management, um, and we're, you know, looking at these cedar zones as well, and we're going to be messaging out to all of the designations um, from the state perspective as well pretty soon, so just know that that's coming. <laughs> Susan? Yes, hi, Rachel. This is Susan Gosselin with Osceola County. Uh, I noticed the Cedars zone closest to us is quite a lot like the one in Miami-Dade County in that it's conservation lands, extremely rural, annual floodplain. Uh, basically, yeah, we'd, we'd like to know how to get a little more involved in this process. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, the best way to get involved is to send feedback to the um, to that email address. We are continuing to refine and evolve the methodology, and specifically, the National Risk Index team is continuing to update and inform uh, the updates to the National Risk Index that use is used in the methodology. And so, any uh, input or additional data sets or information that you can share back with that, I think is particularly helpful in helping us to refine that moving forward. Um, this is just the initial round of designation. So we do expect additional designations to be made um, probably in the next year to 18 months um, to continue to expand that. This cohort was intentionally small so that we could um, work out some of the kinks, so to speak, in the methodology and make sure that we have the best information and we're looking at it from a perspective that uh, makes sense and uh, works for, for the goals of this initiative. So we welcome any feedback, both on the, the methodology, the data, uh, and how that's been captured uh, to help improve this into the future. Good. Um, I do have one more question. I, I think it was clear that um, the these designations will be able to prioritize some of the funding, and this is very important. We want to be able to flag the communities that we also understand are very vulnerable uh, here in South Florida. So uh, I'm volunteering myself, the team, to, to maybe put together some of the comments as a group and, and send to you. I think this would be good. We can definitely do that in working with FDM, too, since you're doing some reviews. Um, so uh, my, my question there is related not on this part that I think you presented really well and kind of explained to us that the National Risk Index was used plus the, the Environmental Justice uh, Disadvantage Community designation. The piece that I was a little bit not fully uh, understanding, and you said you're going to refine in the future, but I, the certification piece, so you were talking about like um, 
adding this, um, certifying the, 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 the zone as a, a resiliency zone or certifying a project. Can you please just provide a little bit more details on what is the plan and, and what, what, how this can be used? Sure. So um, that is something that is a lot or is authorized for FEMA to do as a part of the legislation, uh, because the priority focus right now has been uh, and over the you know for the past year has really been on developing that methodology and the initial designation to allow access to the benefits under the BRIC program and to identify some other. Uh, financial and technical assistance benefits by other federal agencies, we haven't really gotten into what that looks like for um, that certification project. But the idea generally behind it is just to establish um, some process within FEMA, so or, or some process for FEMA to um, help certify or establish a project certification approach to improve um, how, how opportunities might exist for um, investments to drive resilience within these communities. So um, I know that's a little vague right now. We, we honestly haven't had a chance to really dive into this. Um, I expect that as we continue to uh, look at this and consider this, we will likely put out another request for information similar to what we did with the methodology uh, to solicit feedback and input from communities about um, how that might work or what that might look like. And again, we would welcome uh, inputs from all of you and from, from your community partners in, in doing that so that we can make sure that whatever that looks like in the future, it is something that is productive and useful for the, the communities involved. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Any other question? Hearing none, uh, thank you again for joining us today. We'll certainly reach back to you with some questions. Uh, we'll be in touch, Rachel. Thank you. And with that, I will, trans I will transition to Kristin Lenz. Uh, yeah, you can go over there. Thank you, Kristin, for joining us today. All right. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> Sorry, my throat doesn't want to work this morning, but hi, everyone. Again, my name is Kristen Lentz. I'm with the Florida Division of Emergency Management. Um, my particular role is in mitigation planning. So we are responsible for maintaining and updating the hazard uh, mitigation plan for Florida, the State Hazard Mitigation Plan or the SHIMP, as we like to call it, because it's a lot of words to put together a lot. So um, that's what I'm going to be mainly talking about today. But I also am responsible for coordinating the local mitigation planning efforts as well. And I see some of my LMS partners in the room. So it's always nice to um, see you all in person. So um, <clears throat> before I get into it, um, can you all just raise your hand if you've checked out our SHIMP before? Good, so a good majority of you have, which is very exciting for me. Um, but if you haven't, I hope maybe you check it out you know, later this week or today, um, kind of see what it's all about. But for those of you who maybe haven't heard of it before, I'm gonna give a little bit of a background before I kind of dive into the website. So um, what is state hazard mitigation planning? First of all, um, this planning effort is required by FEMA in order to um, you know, be eligible for particular funding pots. Um, one of those is the hazard mitigation <clears throat> assistance funding programs. So you've heard uh, BRIC and FMA already today, but also the hazard mitigation grant program. Um, as well as the public assistance program. So um, it's very important for that reason, but another reason is just that it's the guiding um, plan as far as hazard mitigation is concerned for the state. So it's really that long-term risk reduction, um, you know, mitigation strategy planning effort that we take every five years. So these plans are required to be updated every five years. 
Um, and lucky for you all, we just went through that effort and completed it earlier this year. So that's why I get to talk to you about it today. Um, so <clears throat> we started this effort back in, I don't know, maybe 2022. It feels like it's been forever. But um, what we did is we took the old plan, which was not a working website. It was a PDF of around 500 pages with another 1,000 pages of appendices, and we turned that into a website. So you can imagine 1,500 pages. Who's going to read that? Not one person? Oh, OK. I get that. I hadn't read it fully either. So um, that's why we were like, OK, how can we make this more useful? How can we make this? you know, a usable document, especially for our local mitigation strategy partners. Um, you're really the people that the information is most beneficial for. So we thought, let's turn it into a website. You know, at least you can click around easier. You can find the information um, a little quicker than, you know, scrolling through PDF pages. And uh, we worked with our GIS team to identify the platform um, ArcGIS Hub. So if you've had any GIS experience, maybe you've heard of Hub, but essentially it's the ArcGIS version of a working website. And using that allowed us to integrate some of ArcGIS's um, capabilities that we want to use for this plan, meaning you know, working in dynamic ArcGIS maps, um, and some of the other tools that they have. So um, I'll go ahead and just start showing you guys the plan. Um, so this is the home or the landing page. Um, if you scroll down on this page, it's really a good introduction into what state hazard mitigation planning is. Why do we do it? Um, why is it required? And then what you can expect throughout this website. Um, these plans are required to have, you know, various sections to them, and the website <clears throat> is laid out kind of like those sections. So we have the planning, the risk assessment, the mitigation strategy, funding, and resources. So planning is really um, how did you create this plan, how did you update it, what steps did you take? Who did you involve? You know, what was the timeline? It's really just us describing to the reader what did we do to update this plan. You can see the history of the SHIMP. There's some timelines in here, and it talks about how we updated it and how we plan to maintain it over the next, you know, four and a half years or so. Beyond that is when we have to start assessing risk. Um, so, you know, before you can come up with a strategy, you have to know what the issues are. What risks does the state face? And why are we vulnerable to those hazards? So that's the type of information that you're going to find in the risk assessment. Um, so here in the 2023 update section, it kind of just describes what we did for this particular update of the plan, how we changed the hazards. Um, we actually added two hazards based on, you know, FEMA guidance and, um, you know, a, a surgence of um, occurrences of algae blooms. So we added algae bloom and um, dam failure to the plan. So um, what else? We talk about changes in development. And um, again, throughout this whole website, you'll see local mitigation strategy integration. It's not enough to have a statewide plan, but we want to make sure that our efforts integrate with the local efforts as well and supplement those local efforts. So you'll see here that there are natural hazards and human-caused hazards. So the only hazards that are required by FEMA are natural hazards because their grant funding programs really only um, fund those types of projects. But it wouldn't be a clear picture 
of threat without looking at human caused and technological hazards as well. So we do look at those hazards, but it's not at as deep of a level as we have to have for the natural hazards. So I wanted to show you all um, just one of the hazard profiles so you know what to expect. But here's the landing page for the natural hazards. You can see um, it goes through 11 different hazards and how those hazards may impact the state. So up here, we have the wildfire hazard profile. I know we're talking a lot about flooding today, so I wanted to show you guys something a little bit different. But there is, of course, a flooding hazard profile if you want to look at that later. So um, in each hazard profile, we have to look at a variety of factors. We have to, one, describe it. So what is wildfire? We have to talk about location, you know, where in Florida may be <clears throat> most impacted by wildfire. We have to look at historic occurrences. You know, what are the major wildfire occurrences that have happened in the past? Um, we have to look at probability of future occurrence. We have to look at climate change and um, how future conditions might impact this hazard's impact on the state. Um, that's one of the new requirements that came out with the new state um, uh, FEMA guidance. So that's something that we had to really dig into and add for this update. We have to look at impacts. How does the hazard overall impact the state? And then vulnerability. Vulnerability is going to be the most beefy section. Um, it really takes all that information and says, OK, oh, thank you so much, says, um, OK, so what? Why should we care about wildfire in this state? You know, what are the most vulnerable assets? Um, what are the most vulnerable jurisdictions? And what are the most vulnerable populations? So I'm going to quickly scroll through and get down to vulnerability. But you can see up here, we go through, you know, just a description of wildfire location. This is where we get into some of our maps and our GIS team at FDEM really is behind all of these mapping um, products that you'll see throughout the plan. Historic occurrences and significant events. Probability, looking at you know, future risk for wildfire. Climate change, a, just, you know, a description of how climate change might impact future conditions of this hazard. Impacts of population, the built environment, you know, natural resources, the economy, and the government. And then finally, vulnerability. So we are required to do a vulnerability analysis and loss estimation of the jurisdictions in Florida as well as of state assets. So this first section looks jurisdiction by jurisdiction, and we use kind of those county boundaries for that and has some tables. We also you know, pulled data from FEMA's NRI map um, and kind of listed out figures all throughout here. Speaking of the NRI map, another effort that we did to look at local or LMS integration as well as the federal perspective, what we did is we looked through each of the 67 county plans or the local mitigation strategy plans, and we um, looked at how they ranked wildfire as a hazard for their county. And that's what the um, map is on the left, and then we um, also pulled in the data from the NRI map just to show a comparison. How does the local level, you know, look at wildfire risk and how does the federal level? We don't do any more comparisons than that, but I wanted it to be a tool for LMS groups to say, you know, how does the federal level look at it? Why do they do it that way? And how do we do it? Do we want to maybe alter how we do it? Or do we really think that you know, this is our true risk? Again, we look at state assets as well. And then finally, the overall vulnerability section is where we talk more about vulnerable populations. So 
Um, <clears throat> this is one of the more exciting things that we were able to do with this update of the plan. Um, using ArcGIS Hub really allowed us, again, to integrate some of the more powerful tools of ArcGIS straight into the map, where, or straight into the plan, whereas before it was just a PDF page, you couldn't do anything with it. So what we did is we took our risk maps, our map that shows the areas of Florida that are most at risk to wildfire, and then we overlaid that with the CDC's SVI, or Social Vulnerability Index data, to show the areas of the state that are most at risk and most vulnerable. So as you can see here, the areas in purple are gonna be the most at risk and the most vulnerable. And you can you know, scroll all the way down to you know, the parcel level. It shows where it is and what their SVI score is as well as um, their risk score. So again, this is just another way that we wanted to enable better decision making at the local level. You can look at your county and say, okay, what are the areas most at risk and are we you know, targeting mitigation efforts to those areas? And then below that is just a description of how, <coughs> th <coughs> sorry, this hazard might um, or will impact socially vulnerable populations and who they are. And then um, finally, what the score is, the vulnerability score for that hazard. So that's what the risk assessment is all about. From there, we get into the mitigation strategy. Now that we know what the risk is, okay, what are we gonna do about it? Um, here in Florida, the project level you know, strategy is really delegated down to the counties. We don't know risk of each county level as well as the counties do. So we don't come up with, hey county, we want you to do this project. Well, instead we have state initiatives. So that really um, is what this section is all about. We have our statewide goals for mitigation. And then we have a, <clears throat> um, you know, state level action plan. Um, we also are required to coordinate with state agencies, non-governmental agencies, and look at local policies and programs. So you can see here, there's a breakdown of each of those that we coordinated with. Um, at, in the funding section, this is where we say, okay, now we know, you know what our strategy is, how are we gonna fund that? Um, I think this is gonna be really important for the local communities to say, okay, what you know, resiliency and <clears throat> mitigation grants are out there for me to tap into. So there's a um, you know, detailed breakdown of each of these grant programs in here. Some of them are much longer than others, which again is why this website is so useful. You can open them and collapse them as you want. The last couple things I wanted to touch on were just some resources that we have. So we have some state agency resources. We really looked at, um, okay, what are the agencies that are most involved in mitigation and resiliency? And we wanted to have a spot where we could link to their efforts as well. So um, you can see that here, you know, South Florida Water Management District is in there. Um, we link to, you know, your resiliency plan and all of that. So that's a good spot to go for those types of resources. And then on the local government side, again, back to those LMS working groups, there's some planning and grant resources. So on the grant side of things, one of the efforts that we um, undertook was to map um, some of the, or all of the mitigation projects that we have funded in the past through our various grant programs. This is in the very early stages, so just bear with us, but um, eventually we're hoping that this is gonna be a tool that you can use to see kind of what's been funded, where it's been funded, look for other ideas from other counties. There's, you can see there's detailed information in here about what grant program it was funded under, what it is, how much it cost, 
um, all those good things. And then below that, um, there's just other grant resources that we thought were, would, would be very helpful. Project development, et cetera. Um, and then on the planning side, we have a map of um, the state of Florida, and it, if you click in the um, counties, it links to their information for the LMS plans. So it says when their LMS plan was approved, when it expires, and when the six-month update date is, so that should help you know when do I have to submit this plan to FDEM again? And then there's a link to it if it's available online. Um, that is a direct result of feedback that we received from local partners through our planning process. Like, hey, we want you know, a one-stop shop uh, spot to go look and find these LMS plans. And then again, just information that would be helpful for an LMS update. Um, risk assessment tools, integration, stuff like that. So the last thing I wanted to note before I'll open it up for questions is um, there is a feedback page. It's just a quick, I don't know, four or five question survey. Once you have a um, chance to look through the plan, let us know what you think. This is our first time turning a 1500 page plan into a website. So um, we're hoping that it can, you know, just continue to get better. What resources work, what don't, what's missing, uh, we would really love to know. Um, and then Carolina wanted me to talk about, okay, what's next? Um, so again, these plans are updated every five years. So we're kind of on the back burner for a few years with this plan. We're shifting into LMS update season, but that doesn't mean we're not just gonna leave the website for you know another three and a half years. Um, we plan to have annual reports of the plan and you know update some of these maps annually. So um, that's something that you can look forward to, one of those being the MIT map or the map of previously funded projects. We would like to update that at least annually and then maybe even more often than that. Um, so some, those are some of the things that we would like to do. And then just again, researching how other states are doing it, how can we make this better um, for the next update that will probably start here in another you know, two and a half to three years. So. Um, that's really all I have, unless you guys have some questions. Thank you, Kristen. Yes, go ahead. Good morning. Um, Jerry Clarday, uh, Palm Beach County yes. LMS coordinator. Congratulations. I read where uh, Florida is the first SHIMP to be on this type of online uh, format. Yes. I started my position mid-April. We began our revision in June. We have to turn it into you guys um, April 1st. I would love to transition into this platform, but mm -hmm. I don't want to be an LMS Icarus. How long did it take for you to get it into this <laughs> format? That's a slightly complicated question. So we updated the plan and turned it into a website at the same time. So all of that, I'd say, probably took two to two and a half years. But um, a lot of that was, you know, GIS stuff and what, what, it, what it might be. So I'd say to create the website as is maybe about a year. Um, and I'm glad you brought that up because ArcGIS and Esri, so Esri is the company that you know makes ArcGIS and they have hub templates. So templates that um, kind of come pre-made and you can just kind of plug and play from there. They have one of those for local mitigation strategy plans. Um, so what I wanna do is look more into that with them, make sure that it you know, follows all FEMA regulations, which they say it does, and then I would love to um, kind of you know, present that to you all to kind of help you know, boost you forward um, in that effort. But yeah, if you wanna do your update and then try and do that later on, that's always a possibility as well. We're, we're here to work with you, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
I'm sorry. It would be really nice to have data download capabilities. I was lo I'm looking around, and there's just some layers that would really be nice to bring in with some of our layers in order to compare um, with that. Yeah, that's a really good point, and we've heard that from other people. Um, so, you know, we're going to work with our GIS team to figure out how to make that, you know, more accessible. But, yeah, that's a great point. Thank you. Actually, it doesn't even need to be data download. It can be open, uh, a open data portal that allows us to get to the G GeoJSON or um, uh, the, and I'm just drawing a blank. But if we can get to the feature services so we yeah. can perform analyses on them, then we're all working on the same page across the state. Great, yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Any more questions? So yeah, um, I, I really recommend that you spend some time uh, looking at that. I was impressed by the amount of information that was put together in a very user-friendly. It was like very nice to read through the documents to find a lot of relevant information that can back up any of your planning processes, grant applications. There is readily available resources there that are very useful to get, very quickly to get, and it's impressive to see how much information is compiled in one place in such a dynamic way. Our plan has 300 pages this year for the first time. I'm, I'm wondering if I can ever have a conversation with our GIS team when I get to the 1,500 pages <laughs> to, translate <that> to, <laughs> to translate that to an online portal. But it's, it's, of course, very, very well put together and much easier to access the information. I do have one quick question for you, Christine. I, I hate to ask the question with you on, on my back. It's weird. But... Um, <laughs> So uh, I, we talk about this when you came here to visit us um, on your tour uh, throughout the state to, to get feedback from the, the local counties and communities. Um, I remember I asked the question about the state projects the, uh, on the more um, maybe regional types of projects. You clarified to me at that time that no, there is no, not necessarily state projects identified via this process. You mostly rely upon the LMS is bringing you the list of projects and you integrate to your plan here. I'm wondering if there is any effort to start identifying some projects that perhaps are beyond the, the LMSs that are more regional. Um, and uh, also, I want to know if you have, if, you, if the map, if you have map with all the LMS plans or only with the funded projects. Um, yeah, so that's a great question. As far as um, identifying <clears throat> more regional projects, we have not undertaken that um, at the state level. Um, but I know some of you are, may have been on the Regional Planning Council meeting yesterday, and it's in some of their, you know, future, uh, uh, you know, positions to go ahead and do that. Um, but, you know, that's something that we might consider at the state level as well. Um, and then as far as what the MIT map shows or the map with all the projects, it is just going to be funded projects at this point. Um, we do get, you know, LMS project lists from all of our uh, LMS communities or counties. Um, however, it's not kind of that data level specific type information of, okay, where do they want to do the drainage project or where do they want to put the generator? It's just, you know, fire station generator or um, elevation of 21 homes. So to be able to put that on a map, we would need more detailed information. Um, but I do know that some counties are kind of taking the same uh, approach of mapping their projects as well. So, um, you know, maybe it's something that we can look more into in the future, but at this point, that map is just going to show previously funded projects. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't have any more questions. Anybody else? Okay. Yeah. And uh, we will certainly benefit from having those those maps uh, available so we can use also in our processes. And one thing that I can promise, and I know the GIS team is not going to be mad at me, is that we are going to have at least our layers for the residency plan as an open data portal for the next cycle. Not a plan entirely in the GIS, but the maps, we, will, we are working on that. <laughs> she is. I am like here saying, we want the whole plan in the GIS. No, the maps are, are, are our next step. No, thank you very much, Kristen.
Now I'm going to transition to Megan. I think she has um, some updates that um, from a meeting that she had uh, on the National um, Council, uh, Counties uh, Organization. Sorry, I'm blanking on the name, not NACO. NACO. Yeah, yes. I'm blanking on the description. Uh, and it was related to our last conversation in the forum, like a little bit of this conversation on resiliency planning and mitigation. So I think it's very timely that you get the chance to talk with the, at the national level about that. Thank you all. Um, is it a, can you hear me okay if I just talk from the seat? All right, good, thank you. So Megan Houston, Resilience Director for Palm Beach County, um, and I'm here to give a few remarks before you all get your first break officially of the day, so I'll, uh, I'll keep it brief. But I was uh, fortunate to be part of NACO's uh, Resiliency Roundtable that they had in February in D.C. earlier uh, in 2023, Na NACO is the National Association of Counties. Uh, our Palm Beach County is very involved in the working groups that they have. I know a lot of our counties here are involved too. Um, and they have a resiliency task force um, where our, elect our, our mayor has been a chair of that as well. But this, this round table, Palm Beach County, Broward County, Martin County were represented um, along with some Louisiana and Texas folks. It was a very strong Southeastern uh, representation. It was sponsored by NACO and the Pew Charitable Trust. And the point of having us uh, coordinate was figuring out how to build capacity for disaster resilient. Um, and the round table, the group spent time saying, well, we need to define what that capacity is to make sure that we can uh, achieve that. And the, the summary from the roundtable was local capacity, the definition, the elements that are included in that include funding. Do we have money to do what we want to do? Staffing. Do we have people who have that time to actually work on these projects and implement that? Who are the champions? Are they uh, housed in an office or are they integrated throughout? Hopefully it's both. Um, in my opinion. Authority, do you have an authority to act and create policies and procedures? Partnerships, do we have those nonprofits and those agencies and the data from those folks uh, available? Um, data and data analytics specifically, um, like what Kristen just showed today, you know, that stuff is really crucial. And then education, both among policymakers and our residents. A lot of our elected officials stressed that education was the, m the most critical, perhaps. So nothing, um, you know, from those six elements, you'd say, sure, of course, that makes sense. So nothing groundbreaking or earth shattering. But what I think is helpful is that this well-respected national entity um, laid it out in a nice format that's very shareable and, and user-friendly, and we can, um, I think, in the follow-up from today's conversation, send out that report if we haven't already. And it's, it's something that I think we all can use to justify why we need to allocate funding, why we need to go for staffing, why we need to be um, getting uh, the, the grant dollars to acquire the data, why we need to be looking at using and developing interfaces like what uh, Kristen just presented. So it's a good justification, it's helpful, it's a well-respected entity that produced the report, um, and I think it's, it's good justification to continue the work that we're doing, as well as um, the second takeaway is just the need for, if you have capacity at a county level, if you're a larger municipality and you can help the, um, the, the local governments who don't yet have that dedicated staff person. That's really essential to moving forward as, a, as partners. Um, and we were, I'm, I'm honored that Dr. Brooks included a shout out to me in, the, in his opening remarks about the grant application that we pursued, but that was one of the outcomes from the round tables. Um, we, we went at a, a county level and uh, figured out who in Palm Beach County were the municipalities that didn't yet have capacity to pursue Resiliency Florida grant planning um, applications, and we put together that bundled application on behalf of six municipalities. I think we'll see more examples of that happening. I hope we do. And um, those are really the, the main highlights from the event. So NACO is available for us as a resource. Um, it's a good forum to join. And if, you're, if your county is a member, and um, look forward to sharing the report with you all. Thank you.
Thank you, Megan. Thank you very much. It was interesting that that happened just after our discussion here. We would lay out so many different um, efforts that are ongoing right now that we can leverage uh, at the county level, at the state level, between resiliency planning, uh, all the LMS plans, uh, coordination in general. They, in our discussions, we also prioritize communication, education a lot. That was one of the items that we all put together uh, on that uh, Venn diagram that I presented earlier today. So there is a lot of those conversations happening at multiple levels, and the message seems to be kind of the same, partner laying out a path and, and really collaborate and leverage existing information. Uh, it was great. Thank you. So... Um, with that, I, I think we're going to have a 10-minute uh, break. Let me just check the time. So maybe 14, let's come back at the 10.40 um, for us to, to go into the second uh, portion of our forum today. Thank you.
all of you. Uh, we have our presenter getting ready to uh, restart our agenda. It's already 10.42. I know we all need this time, and we added this break because we know that we need to be connecting here. It was great to have those discussions. But let's get back because we do have a lot to discuss now. We are getting to uh, some uh, really great um, parts in our agenda. So, yes, thank you. So we're going to have, um, let, me, let me just confirm we are live. Um, Yvette, uh, Devon, are you back to Zoom live? We are live. Okay, perfect. Thank you for everyone that is also um, listening to us online. So um, we have this um, item that we brought to this agenda after la uh, two weeks ago event, actually. So we were basically, all of us, trying to get to the largest summit ever in Miami. Uh, Jim hosted 900 people there. We woke up that morning. Uh, I woke up with no power up here in Palm Beach County. I know one of the main presenters could not even take a shower. It was a funny story <laughs> from the compact. Uh, but anyway, we were always struggling to get to the event on that morning. And of course, the topic of the discussions when we all were there was related to the rainfall that was occurring and a lot of the flooding that was happening around us. So all of us struggled, all the trains were delayed, uh, traffic was a little bit more chaotic than normal uh, to get there. And we spent a significant portion of the breaks there on the event also discussing this and understanding some limitations. Uh, so uh, one of the cities that we knew were uh, suffering a lot from that was um, uh, Oakland Park. I, we had contacted Susan. She was really, uh, they always do this kind of effort there in the county, and I knew from my previous experience that they were looking at those uh, levels in the system as a whole and trying to understand how they could optimize their operations. So we start connecting with them, with the city, and our um, water managers here at the district to understand how we could optimize operations in general. I really like what Albert said to us after we went through all those, those discussions in terms of how can we seek to optimize the opportunities of uh, discharging to those primary canals for both upstream and downstream communities. So this is a lot of what we were discussing there and we really felt it was gonna be important for us to extend this discussion uh, since we have this all fresh in our heads to, uh, to understand how we can do, uh, and beyond the planning, we have significant planning efforts going on. We have the CNSF study going on that is going to focus a lot on exactly what we're going to be discussing here. We have our resiliency projects. All the communities and local governments also have projects that they are planning. But uh, until we get to the project implementation and full construction step, what can we do? How can we seek to, to really communicate even further and, and, and find ways that we can operate the system under all those limitations that we have? It was a major King Tide event. We have been tracking it, so it, it really exacerbates the conditions. So we want to be able to fully understand that. And so we, we City of Oakland Park volunteered themselves quickly to come and join us. And we also uh, reach out to Dana Beach and Fort Lauderdale. They all prepare slides on the very last minute, and we appreciate you all being here. So we're going to start with Albert, City of Oakland Park. They're going to mostly talk about how their storm water occurred during that event from a local perspective. And then we can have a follow-up discussion after the three presentations. So thank you, Albert, for joining us. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Carolina. Uh, yeah, again, Albert Carver, I'm the Public Works Director for the City of Oakland Park. Uh, Carolina did a great introduction because we were in the midst of that November rains. Uh, and I have a sustainability coordinator, Molly Furch, is here today, and she was taking the bright line down here from, from Boca Raton and uh, unfortunately got to the, the, uh, the climate compact about an hour and a half late because of the trials and tribulation of even taking the, the bright line down. I came from Fort Lauderdale and I was able to go down A1A. 95 was brought, uh, shut down, so as we everybody made it down to the convention center in Miami, or Miami Beach, it was a... It was an adventure in rain events and post-rain events. But what I'm going to talk about is a little bit about the coordination of what we had with Broward County, Susan Bodwin's here, and what we coordinated with South Florida Water Management District throughout the, the, the three-day event. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Oakland Park is, uh, where's Oakland Park? We're in central Broward County. We are not a coastal community. We're one of the, the two cities that 
is essentially surrounded by the city of Fort Lauderdale, the other being Wilt Manors. Uh, we are about 45,000 population, eight and a half square miles, uh, located again in central Broward County. Uh, we sit in a bowl. That bowl is with the C-14 and C-13, uh, South Florida Water Management, the district's canals being at an operation level higher than most of our city, and then the coastal ridge at the at the, the east side and then the water conservations on the west side. So we, ha we have challenges even in normal operation getting water out of our city. Uh, we do have an extensive drainage system that we've constructed since the year 2000. Uh, consisting of all these elements, uh, th uh, the five pump stations there at the bottom that we're getting ready to expand. Our system is, is built to be a multi-level system. We, we rely on our swales, our surface uh, areas to percolate the water down. We have exfiltration trenches to get water below the surface, get it out of the roadways. Then our roadways to store that water and then the positive drainage going into the, the, our local canals, local lakes, and then the regional canal system for discharge. Uh, uh, before we talk about the August rains, let's talk about the April rains. The April rains occurred around the International Airport. They got approximately 28 inches of rains. Uh, Nancy's, uh, Dr. Gassman has more information about that from Fort Lauderdale. That was not a thousand year storm. It was one inch below a thousand year storm. So you got a 500 year storm. Then as you go away from Fort Lauderdale International Airport, the, at the, the city of Fort Lauderdale wastewater treatment plant, that was less than a mile or a mile plus away. Uh, they anticipate, I heard that they had 18 inches, significantly less. Then we're seven miles away from that, and we experienced nine inches of rain. So there's a very concentrated rain, uh, event. How that affected us, that, that downstream portion that around FLL blocked, uh, built up water in the intercoastal, the New River, the Middle River, almost like a tidal surge coming into the city. So we are not able to get any of that nine inches of water out of the system. There wasn't water coming from the, as much water coming from the west. It was the water backed up at the east that eliminated, that prevented us from discharging, causing water to back up into the Middle River and to the city. Then we go into the the August rain or the November rains that we just had, nine inches in, in, in April. Here we had 12.3 inches. Different event. The rain was more concentrated to the west, not the east. But we also had the tidal surge, the king tides and tidal surge coming up. So we, we were receiving water from both ends of the system, both the east and the west. Uh, Brow, again, Brow, Oakland Park, where do we sit? We sit in the regional Broward County mapping system. We sit between the C-13 West and C-13 East basins with the S-36, S-36 structure operated by the district being the salinity control structure on the S-13 or the, the C-13 basin defining those two East-West basins. Now to the, the, I have a very short presentation. I have two more slides really. This is what we're gonna talk about the, where the, the S-36 uh, structure sits of working with the district, working with Broward County, how can we get water out of Oakland Park and into the, the main canal systems and to discharge? S36 structure regulates the water coming into the system, so the, the district needs to look at water coming out of the water conservation areas, how it's uh, affecting the western communities. It is also the defining point for the, the east and west basins. The structure to the north that you see this prospect well field, that's a, another gate structure that separates the west and east structure, east basins. And then the 27 county district 27 structure is, a, is mostly a tidal structure preventing tidal surge going into those canals that are, that's to the north and to the west and the, what we call the Royal Palm Lakes, which are the two large lakes directly between those two two structures I just talked about. What we experienced was water, the tidal surge coming up and then the discharge from the district coming down. So we were unable to get any of our water out of that basin. And then later in the storm, say Friday, Friday morning, late Thursday night, Friday morning, that Prospect Road area, the C-13 West Basin, started overflowing into that, overflowing into the, our, our Royal Palm Lakes, across that roadway, 38th Street, between the 27 and the, the Prospect Road, 
flooded those roads, flooded those communities right there. I don't know if my, my mouse is working. So into that, the C-13 canal, which is diagonal going into 95. The, the Sleepy River pump station, which is the last uh, area to the, to the right of your screen, uh, that is a, a pump station we built in 2010 or 2011, 2012. That uh, is, uh, it, it's modeled off for the district's pump station. It's a four pump system with two gates. We, it's a tidal structure. We can shut the gates to keep the tidal control, tidal uh, surge coming up into the neighborhoods. We can open the gates, allow water to flow. We can close the gates and pump through, pump through the system to discharge. We operated that as we could. As tides went down, we, we pumped water. It has a very limiting uh, operational system because if we do if we do pump uh, at a greater elevation of 3.75 that it will flood the downstream communities the cities of, of Willett Manors and the city of Oakland Park those areas to the to the east so very limiting uh, operational uh, coordination of that that uh, sleepy river pump station there uh, what we did with uh, working with the operations people at, at Broward County and South Florida Water Management District at the S36 structure uh, Thursday afternoon, working with Carolina and the operational staff. They started throttling the, the gate at, 30, at S36, lowering it so it wasn't at 100% discharge. It started backing up to the Western communities. As Carolina said, we, we, set, a, we set an operational parameter for our city is that we, we, want, uh, we don't mind our roads being covered with water. Uh, we don't want structures getting any infiltration, but we do want our waters pass passable by emergency vehicles. So letting that, setting that uh, parameter with district operational staff, they said we can deal with that in this storm right now. Every storm is going to be different, but right now, so they were able to lower their gates, throttle it down, letting us discharge some of our water. Once we said, okay, we're ready to go, they'd open the gate back up and we went back and forth for that late Thursday Friday events as, as water starting to dissipate. Uh, and then as we go into first future resiliency coordination, uh, we're gonna continue to coordinate with, with the district, with Broward County. We also have capital improvement investments or capital investments for the city. I know the district and the county also have, we have three separate uh, projects going, undergoing right now. We have a master plan that we've completed, master and pilot calls for three separate uh, New pump stations, one of those is already designed. We're ready, get, getting ready to permit that, or excuse me, bid that. Then uh, we have a pump station that we're in the consultant selection process uh, that will discharge directly into C-13 canal, and the third pump station is yet to be in the, in the planning area. The last thing we were working on, we did in 2020 do a, uh, a vulnerability assessment update. Unfortunately, that does not meet the current state requirements so we're getting ready this year to update that uh, vulnerability assessment uh, assessment plan to so we can be qualified for the, for additional state revol state resiliency funds we have also been fortunate to get 8.6 million dollars of the floor resiliency fund to pay for the one pump station that is under the consultant selection pro process and another one that I, I'm glad that we FEMA was talking about those area. One of those projects that we got 1.8 million dollars is is in that census tract that's identified in the the uh, available that's a, uh, eligible for the for additional funding. So with that said, I am available for any questions or if any, any other entity is going to talk about the, uh, the November rains. Thank you. Thank you, Albert. Yes. Thank you. Very helpful. Um, does, does the city operate a, a waste treatment plant, sewer plant? Uh, no, we don't. We, uh, we, dis we, we, don't have, we have no water treatment plant or no wastewater treatment plant. We buy our water from Fort Lauderdale. A portion of the city is under the water, uh, Broward County Water and Wastewater Services. They get their water directly from from them. And then the, the area of the city that we purchase water from Fort Lauderdale, we're so giving that we give the wastewater, wastewater back to them. So they discharge, they, they use that at their wastewater treatment plant down at uh, the, the so, uh, so Everglades. were any part of the, what you experienced, uh, the stormwater system infiltrating the the sewer system and, and over over I mean maybe it wasn't the city but the among the partners that's what's happening in our county we're you know we're looking at three times the 
the amount of water flowing into the treatment plants during these events? Uh, we see a little bit more than that, that during those events. That uh, during those events, we, we see uh, it's all force mains pressurized pipe that we're, we're trying to pump into to go to the wastewater treatment plant. We see pressures that exceed our ability to pump into them. Uh, that includes the city of Fort Lauderdale, Wilton Manors portion of Davie, Port Everglades that try to pump into that system. So that increase, that increase in, in I and I infill, inflow and infiltration causes those pressures to go up. Uh, we as a region, the Central Broward Regional Wastewater System, uh, have aggressive programs to try to, to uh, control our I and I. The city, both the city of Wilton Manors and Fort Lauderdale and with Oakland Park has have a, a, a limited EPA grant that we're gonna be able to, to help seal up those pipes and all of us have additional funds that we're trying to get very aggressive in doing that. I think that's a problem in all of Southeast Florida or South Florida in general. Certainly a problem in Miami. That was one of my main jobs, my first jobs when I got to Florida. <laughs> So um, the, the, the point that Albert brought in his presentation that is something that we are trying to seek as a, a main output of today's meeting was the elevation for that particular event that he was trying to get uh, that would uh, allow, of course, flooding to occur in the streets, as he, his pointed, but not to get into properties. So I think that was something that uh, he quickly had identify and communicate it with the operations team. So trying to keep that elevation under control. This is something that we're gonna to try to do today and start this process here with all those this communities that we are, uh, especially during those King Tide events and downstream communities. So one of the outputs that we wanna be able to get out of this conversation is really the commitment for all of you to help in identifying those critical levels, critical elevations that we need to be attentive to and we have Asif here. He's one of the lead water managers from the water management district. And uh, we're gonna be sharing and coordinating this information with he and his team. Um, as Albert pointed very uh, effectively, it, it's, those conditions are particular to each event. It's not that we can always do the same response, but we are committed to be having those numbers, to ha be having those conditions and, and keep uh, communication channel very open and close. Albert was given the, the phone number from Suling, the, the, head, the, the, the director of operations, so he was able to call and, and have conversations throughout the event with the water managers here on a very, um, I would say, two-way uh, format. So that's a little bit of what we want to be able to enforce and, and reinforce and, and, and really repeat as we go through those events into the future. So with that, I'm, I'm gonna invite the city of Dana Beach who volunteered, who well, really accepted a, a last minute invitation to come and, and, and talk a little bit about what happened also in Dana Beach and we also have Fort Lauderdale coming next. So Caroline, I think my slides are- Yeah, Nancy's up, up next. next. Oh, sorry, Did my you have bad. A question, Nancy, <laughs> I lost track of the sequence. So yes, Nancy, come next, please. You are gonna talk from the Fort Lauderdale perspective. Did you have a question for me? You'll address it? Hi, my name is Nancy Gassman. I'm the Assistant Public Works Director for the City of Fort Lauderdale. Um, I'm in charge of sustainability, but it easily becomes the office of everything um, every day. Uh, two quick notes before I start my presentation. Albert said something really important, which was he couldn't operate his own pump system at one point because it would have flooded his own community downstream. And one of the things that we are seeing, both at the district and at, as individual communities in the coastal area of Southeast Florida, is that everyone is shifting from a gravity system to a pump system. And it's starting to create winners and losers. Because if you got a pump, you can get water out of your community, but then the downstream community that has a gravity system is, gets to a point where they can't push any water out. Uh, quick note for Mr. Murley, uh, the normal flows into the city of Fort Lauderdale's regional wastewater plants are in the range of 38 million. During these types of rainstorm events, we usually exceed 90, 90 million gallons a day. So there was this storm in November, <clears throat> and I had so hoped to go to the climate summit but was not able to attend because I was in the emergency operations center. Uh, Everyone is aware of the, of the April 12th event where the city of Fort Lauderdale experienced <clears throat> significant 
rain bomb that, that hit mainly the Fort Lauderdale International Airport and our communities on the, the central and south portion of the city. That created a, an extreme sensitization. Uh, we have a, an entire community with PTSD. Whenever it starts raining, they are asking us to bring pumps. And um, you know, I, I've noticed that there's a pond. There's, there's water ponding in the road. You need to send the pump truck. Um, and so when this was forecast, there was an extreme sensitivity in the community saying, please send the resources to my community, pre-position your resources. The city of Fort Lauderdale has two, two mobile pumps. We have roughly 90 neighborhoods. We were not going to pre-position any resources until we understood what was going to be impacted. Um, and so when this was forecasted, there was a lot of people who were very nervous, and we had learned a lot from the April event, and so we were able to start preparing before it hit us, uh, but not to the extent that the community uh, that we could meet the community's expectations of having a very visible response to the rain event. They wanted to see trucks on the road. It didn't matter if you had pre-positioned a pump because a pump wasn't what they were looking for. They were looking for the pump trucks. Um, when you look across the entire city, we have uh, rain gauges throughout the city at, at major locations. What we, what we expected to happen in terms of not having the impacts be in exactly the same place is what we ended up with. On November 14th, the major impacts were in the northern portion of the city where they got five inches of rain. On the 15th, the major impact was in the southwest corner in the Lauderdale Isles, Chula Vista, Riverland neighborhoods. And then on the 16th, it, the major impact was in Melrose Manors. Um, Melrose Manors is a little bit special because they have zero infrastructure and water goes nowhere. And so we always have to go into that neighborhood and try to pump it out. But in the end, you can see that across the city, um, somewhere between 7 and 12 inches of rain fell. Unlike the April event where, where the biggest impacts were in the city uh, of Fort Lauderdale, this was a much broader rain event that, that impacted um, a larger portion of Broward County. Uh, on, for the EOC briefing on November 16th, uh, we highlighted those neighborhoods primarily that were impacted previously, but we made a note that the Chula Vista neighborhood and the Riverland Road neighborhoods were getting impacted. And at the beginning of the event, we had about 34 roadways that were flooded. And by the 16th, which was still during the event, but as the rain was starting to dissipate, we'd managed to clear seven of the roads, <clears throat> but we were also ex experiencing uh, king tides during those days. Um, and while, while we did not have the literally thousand plus homes that got flooded from the April event, uh, there still were homes that were impacted as part of this 12 inch over three day rain event. When you consider the conditions that we were experiencing on uh, the 16th, we had the highest high tide of the year at 2.4 feet NAVD, which means that our coastal communities were not able to push any water out because, again, they're gravity systems, and that any communities that are upstream from that were still experiencing the impact of that king tide, um, especially on the morning of November 16th. Uh, the slide on the side is the groundwater table, and if the left, the right hand, um, the right hand axis is distance to the surface. And you can see that that groundwater table climbed right up to the top, peaked out from the surface, and then started to dissipate as uh, we, we got through the rain event. But once you reach saturation, dra exfiltration drainage systems don't work. You start to get overland flow. It changes the way that drainage happens, which should be a bumper sticker. Um, we also had significant wind conditions. On the 15th, we had a wind directly out of the east. Whenever that happens, it piles water up onto the coast. It holds the tide in, and it usually elevates the tide as well. By the 16th, that low that had swung around the peninsula had come around. Uh, it was kind of even with uh, Dade County at that point in time. The wind started to shift out of the northeast, but it was still enough easterly direction to keep that tide elevated during that time. 
So we got water coming from below from the ground. We've got water getting pushed at us from the east, not just from the king tides, but from this wind event. We got rain coming from the sky, and we've got water coming at us from the west. So Albert talked a little bit about the S-36. There you can see how Fort Lauderdale kind of surrounds Wilton Manors and Oakland Park. Uh, oh, Fort Lauderdale goes further north. Uh, but there we have this S-36 that impacts just one of our 165 miles of waterway through Fort Lauderdale. Uh, I was impressed that Albert has five pumps in his city. We, have, we only have four pumps in Fort Lauderdale at this time, but by the end of the next decade or so, they'll probably in the, be in the range of 20 pumps uh, in Fort Lauderdale that is serving stormwater system. And so as that water comes in from the S-36, it completely surrounds Wilton Manors, and it impacts the southern part of Oakland Park and, and the central portion of Fort Lauderdale. As you look at this graphic, this is um, from DB Hydro Insights. If you've never spent time on that website uh, and you're a data geek, go for it. Uh, you'll have a great time there. So what this is showing is that um, during the initial phase before the rain really started uh, that the base elevation so you have headwaters which is the water to the west you have tailwaters which is the waters to the east um, the tailwaters and the headwaters uh, were at a, what I'm going to describe as a standard level and what happened is that as we were moving through the event and the gates opened the tailwaters increased by three feet of elevation, which directly, again, impacts Oakland Park, Wilton Manors, and the city of Fort Lauderdale, whereas the change in the headwaters was about three quarters of a foot. And the way that I interpret that, and there's people in, in this room that know better than I do, um, is that they hit the operational elevation where it says, according to our protocols, Fort La uh, South Florida Water Management District will open this gate to protect the western communities. So the change in the headwaters was about three quarters of a foot, but the change in the tailwaters, and again, we don't know how far downstream that went, the change in tailwaters was, was over three feet. And so the consequence of this, especially on November 16th, was that during the highest tide of the year that was creating pressure from the east, we were receiving the greatest amount of discharge from the west into the Middle River. Um, there's also a, a red and a blue graphic up there. Um, in November, the peak tailwater that was experienced downstream was 3.6. In April, that number was 4.3. So again, three quarters of a, of, uh, a foot higher tailwaters uh, during the April event. So again, because of uh, City Fort Lauderdale is graced with 165 miles of waterway, we are also graced with the discharge from not one, but four structures from the Water Management District. Um, the S-33 is south of the Middle River. This comes into the North Fork of the New River. We have the G-54, which is the Sewell Lock structure that, that is right next to 595. And then there's the S-19 pump, which is at Griffin Road. And all of these feed into different portions of the New River. And I'm highlighted there, um, the northern circle is Melrose Park. That system is completely dependent on discharging into the North Fork of the New River, literally about 20 feet downstream from the S-33. And then the central circle is Lauderdale Isles, and we got a lot of um, calls from Lauderdale Isles saying the water levels are coming up much faster than it, the rain is falling. What is going on in this area? And then the last bigger circle is Edgewood and River Oaks, which were the substantially flooded locations during the April event. Um, because we had been working on a stormwater system in that area that was literally under construction during the April event, we have continued to make advances there. And once we knew this, this event was going to happen, um, we had the right phone calls in place to activate pumps at the right time. And we ended up putting five pumps in that location, which prevented substantial flooding in that location. Um, so here's the S33. It's in the North Fork. 
and again, we, we were absolutely discharging. You can see the discharges to the right of the screen from the Water Management District. Um, their, their staff gauge is almost underwater at the time uh, on November 16th. That staff gauge reported, uh, that um, st structure reported that they had um, 10, 10 and a half inches at that location. But the critical thing, again, is in the red and the blue, is that during the April storm, the water levels the tailwaters at the the district's structure reached 6.5, and that number is above the discharge amount for the minor structure that comes out of Lauder Hill, which is our discharge point for Melrose Park. And in the no-name storm, it the peak tailwater hit 4.8 which would still allow us to discharge out of Melrose Park. And we did not have flooding in Melrose Park this time because there was still an opportunity for it to discharge. Uh, Sewell Lock, um, similar to what we saw with the Middle River, um, when the rain event happened, there was a rapid increase from about two feet to about five feet uh, in the tailwaters. And this is just upstream from the Lauderdale Isles neighborhood that was saying something's going on. You know, the water's rising very quickly here. Um, and again, the difference between the no-name storm that we had in November and April was not huge. It was uh, 5.3 versus 5.9, but the levels were still higher in April. And then uh, for the S13, which is a pump station, again, similar trend where you see a very rapid increase in the tailwater elevations. But once again, the November storm, we hit 3.8 as a maximum for the peak tailwaters at the structure. And in April, that was almost five feet. So um, the community was nervous, few, few conclusions. The community was nervous since the April rain bomb. Uh, the rainfall was spread over several days, and it fell very differentially over the city on each of those days. Uh, we were able to put pumps in place that allowed us to prevent property damage and did help clear the roads. Um, but the, the drainage, the gravity drainage systems were certainly impacted by those, all, those other water-related activities, the extreme high tide that day on November 16th, the gr high groundwater table, the continuous rainfall, and then these discharges from the west. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nancy, as well as you have been to this uh, discussions here several times, and you have been talking about these issues and to have the opportunity to go through your slides and understand more details on, on the limitations that you have there was very, um, very helpful, and I think it was good to have the opportunity to, to have this discussion here today. It really reinforces that we need more of those conversations in a, in a really coordinated process to respond to those events, more and more constant communication in, in, in a coordinated process. So any question for Nancy at this point, or do we want to go to Dania Beach and then maybe we have this additional conversation at the end? Yes, Caroline, I would just offer one thing, and that yes. is... We only know what the elevation is at the structure. And we don't currently have any sensors that are further downstream from those structures. And you talked about the USGS flood probes. That's going to be really important to start to understand how the tailwater elevations change as they travel downstream and start to understand how the discharge uh, elevations for those various communities along the river relate to the elevation that is created in those waterways by those discharges from the west. Yes, this is something that we have been investing a lot of time, I would say, for the past two, three years in terms of identify. We already identify, as we were advancing, all those level of services studies that there is no data for us to calibrate or validate models downstream because there is really very few gauges, and they are usually at the discharge point. So this was something we have been looking at from more recently, from, from knowing that we have lack of capacity to understand weather levels as a whole uh, in the system, and not a, 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 an ongoing monitoring network 
to read uh, levels there. And not only the, on the downstream side, but also in the upstream side, we also have some limitations in understanding when we have, especially when we are modeling and we are seeing uh, some of those more critical areas where we have kind of balls, as you were describing, like areas with lower elevation upstream as well. And uh, we, can, we might see some accidents we also have not capacity to monitor anything of that flood extension beyond our waterways. So this is something that we have been investing a lot. We're going to talk a little bit next. We have a full presentation only on that, uh, on, on how can we do so. Part of the response will also be investing on, on that side of the, the effort, like bringing the capacity that we have more data so we are all kind of understanding the conditions system-wide. So, uh, we have an initial plan, we have a draft agreement, uh, we have spoke to USGS, and uh, we have our SCADA team uh, with initially fully on board because they really speak the language that we need to speak in terms of system communications. So they are feeling comfortable that we can have that support also from USGS. We also, of course, we need to identify funding uh, if we want to be able to do that monitoring effort. So anyway, we have a lot to do as, as a team here and we are going to start laying out some of the paths uh, as we progress with this conversation. Carolina, can I ask Nancy? Nancy, this may be just anecdotal for your observations. I don't know if the data, but, you know, what we're getting bombarded with is the insurance questions and uh, property value questions. Are these uh, periodic events, do you see that uh, any correlation? between the, these areas that are getting impacted and some of these economic indicators, which are the ones that everybody likes to write about, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. So City Fort Lauderdale has the great benefit of having tidal flooding as well as having these rainfall-related flooding events. Um, in the areas where we have tidal flooding, while we certainly hear the complaints from those that can afford to live in, in these beautiful coastal communities, we're also seeing that the property values continue to go up and up and up in those locations. And when people buy, they tend to buy the land, knock down the structure, and then they build a FEMA-appropriate structure. Um, but that doesn't necessarily help them in situations where the roadways are getting constantly inundated and they are losing access to their home on a reg regular basis because of the tidal flooding. Um, in the other areas, uh, there are certainly people who have left some of those locations because of the extreme impact that they, they felt, but those were also neighborhoods that we were already investing tens of millions of dollars into in order to provide that stormwater protection. We already knew they were vulnerable, and now we've, we've put that money in. Um, after the April event, the city of Fort Lauderdale um, has now developed a program called Fortify Lauderdale, <coughs> and Fortify Lauderdale will uh, it, it took our 20-year stormwater planning process and it squeezed it into 10 years with the expectation that we're currently spending about $200 million on neighborhoods that we already have designed and we expect to spend another $500 million in the next 10 years and we're currently looking at designs for 17 neighborhoods. So the city continues to invest in order to prevent that loss of property value over time. But Currently, we are not seeing property values fall. The median property value in Fort Lauderdale is $660,000. The average home price is $1.7 million. So affordable housing is, is as much as a problem as drainage. OK, let's uh, move to city of Dana Beach, um, our Sean and Great. I'm just going to enter in the backspace. Perfect. <clears throat> Good morning. My name is Sean Shelton, Project Manager with Dania Beach. I want to thank Carolina and the South Florida Waters uh, Management District for inviting us to the forum. 
it was good to learn about our neighbors to the north, Fort Lauderdale and Oakland Park and the challenges they are having. We're having some as well. We specifically want to, specifically want to address uh, the flooding event that we had in November, but it is something we've seen in the past as well. A little bit about Dania Beaches. We are located just south of Fort Lauderdale Hollywood International Airport, north of the city of Hollywood, along the coast, and we extend a little bit west of I-95 as well. Uh, my colleague John Cantero is going to discuss the vulnerable areas that we have within the city our response specifically to the rain events that we experience, and then the plans that Dania has to address these in the future. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. So um, Dania experiences a diff very similar situation as Fort Lauderdale. We both got, I believe, hit uh, probably the hardest by these two rain events this year. And we also, as soon as we have a forecast like that receive the phone calls requesting the pump trucks and um, we ourselves have two or three and we've now contracted a contractor to be on standby whenever we have a rain event to come in and pump although um, even when we're pumping I mean we do our best to pump uh, to give some relief to the uh, neighborhoods but uh, sometimes you know we'll pump and there's really nowhere to even dump the water. So it, it sort of becomes uh, a, a problem that, you know, we do, we do our best, but we're, uh, the efficacy sometimes feels um, we're not entirely sure. The map shows uh, some of our most vulnerable areas. And um, so if you look towards the west, that larger shaded area, 40th Street, um, We've started a lot of stormwater projects there for the past uh, couple of years. And um, what we're doing is we're connecting into Lake George uh, in, in the north side. And so um, it's, it's been helpful in giving some relief to the neighborhoods. But during these storm events and during um, other storm events, the lake quickly gets overwhelmed and we find that the water simply has nowhere to go. So um, in those cases, we sort of have to wait it out. Um, a little bit towards the south on 37th and Sterling is another very vulnerable area where we've done some stormwater projects, installed some, um, some drains and some, some French drains underground. And we've connected those into an FDOT outfall on Sterling uh, and installed a valve there as well. Um, but it really doesn't take very much time for that to be overwhelmed as well. And we still see a lot of flooding um, <clears throat> in the southeast section of the city, there's that large shaded area, and um, this is a really, really problematic area right next to the wetlands. It's very low-lying. It's, it's sort of a bowl between Federal Highway and the wetlands and um, Sheridan and Dania Beach Boulevard. The elevation there is uh, noticeably lower, and we have three existing pumps there. But the wetlands quickly fill up, and the pumps simply have nowhere to send the water. So this year in 24, we're starting a, a stormwater project to install two new pumps and 10 injection wells. Uh, and we hope that that may you know, provide a little bit of relief to that neighborhood. Um, sure. Um, so. This is a little bit of our operations and our stormwater systems that we have existing. Uh, we're also in the middle of an I&I &I project to try and seal as many of the gravity sewers as we can. Uh, we're, we get a lot of infiltration and it affects the, uh, uh, the sewage gets backed up. And, and all of these areas are mostly all residential. So um, the sewage backup affects people's homes and um, we're also in the middle of a stormwater master plan, collecting as much data as we can throughout the city so that we can plan out for the next uh, 20, 30 years. And that, that's all for me. Thank you, thank you very much, Juan and Sean, for coming here and sharing a little bit of um, Similar, again, I think all three presentations of today pointed out to, this, to the very same type of um, uh, issue there, uh, rainfall, limitations in operating the system, bringing pumps to be able to move water, 
out of the most impacted neighborhood. And the main message being uh, today and, and already having the coordinated process will be important. And in the future, as more pumps are added to the system, this is going to be even further, uh, I would say, the critical piece of us communicating well and, and enhancing coordination, it, it's going to be more and more essential as we bring more elements to operate those systems. Uh, so before we, I, I jump to the next step, which is some of the, I would say, tasks that we all want to be committing ourselves to, does, is there any question for the three presenters? Is there anything else that we would like to know? I just got a comment. Uh, yes. For those two areas, I remember they were all, both about eight square miles for Dania and, and for Oakland. You know, the people, they're relatively small, but you're still talking 200 CFS to drain them an inch a day. And the canals downstream have a limited profile. So as we're adding more pump stations, if you increase the flow by 40%, you're doubling the head loss. So if you had a foot head loss between you and the intercoastal, now you've got two feet. And if you double it, you've got four feet. And people in the past have underestimated the limit that there's a limitation. They think, oh, those downstream canals have unlimited capacity, intercoastal has unlimited. That is not true. There's choke points in the inlets, there's choke, North River and all that are not profile canals, are not maintained. And we don't gain flow area like a floodplain, we have canals with, with banks. Even if it goes out of bank, it's not getting any capacity because it's going through a very rough surface. So you're talking about just, a, just an eight, and a half, eight square mile area of Kent Town, 200 CFS, just in other units, you're talking about 100,000 gallons per minute or 140 million gallons a day to deal with, just to get an inch off, not 16 inches, an inch a day. So uh, I think you, there are challenges here is you've got the long distances between the structures the district has to operate and the intercoastal, and there's just a limited capacity. And you've got to think very carefully about adding pump stations because you're just moving the problem downstream if you don't solve the capacity issue. Yes? So, I mean, the reference was just made by Dana Beach to, their, to doing uh, injection. So, I mean, I'm not as far out of my... I mean, how, how, how far can we go with that? I mean, can we address this by doing more of that? I mean, this is all getting really expensive. Not, and the other point is there's a water quality issue running through this whole discussion that we, we just normally can't address because we're not the water quality people. But from, you know, I, what happened in that event for us was spillage onto the streets when, when the uh, volumes went up. So the vacuum trucks are trying to suck up the sewage before they get to the flooding. So, I mean, all this stuff runs together. But I just, my question is the injection wells, are we really, is that a big move, a direction we should be going for the kind of volumes that that gentleman just talked about? Or I, I just don't have a, a feel for this. In terms of our discussions from the planning efforts that we are doing today, uh, we have been looking at that. Uh, on the C8, C9 basin, where we have moved to adaptation planning, that's the first basins that we did. We had a scenario where we had injection wells. At the end, we did not simulate injection wells for, if, if my memory is right, for two reasons. One was the capacity that they could provide in general in a more regional level. They work well more on the local level than on a more regional system. And second, there were some considerations that we were not fully able to address in terms of how when and how we can pump because of water quality limitations. So in terms of the drainage wells, there are, we need to understand fully when I believe there is a retention period and then you can start kind of pumping uh, into, the, into the, the, I mean, our groundwater uh, systems. Um, so I think this has been considered. We have been doing, doing some initial model as part of the strategy. But I would say we, not, we did not fully explore the utilization of injection wells now in terms of a more regional strategy. Just an anecdotal observation. You know, when you build a 60-story building in downtown Miami with a, a parking garage and parking pedestal, the bottom is filled with injection pumps. Yeah. That's all. That's, we're pumping. I don't know where it goes. I don't know what the observations are, but that's the only way they can handle their stormwater. 
and you know because the building is expensive and the return on investments yeah you know they're going to they're just building a huge pumping system in the bottom of the garage i would so, ask uh, Dania, are those deep injection molds or are they shallow like biscayne aquifer it it goes below the um the biscayne aquifer it goes uh florida? yeah well you're in florida so you're deep florida so there yeah the, you know, that goes about five million dollars a pop yep. at a date on that yeah, the cost. and then maybe 15 million gallons maybe that's thir you know 25 20 ish cfs so it's pretty pricey <laughs> that's, yeah, that's that not was, operation cost yeah this is a little bit of the impression that we were having when we were doing those simulations for the the level of service at c8 and c9 basin the cost piece on a more regional scale with the volumes that we were dealing with it was, of course, way beyond the cost that we were seeing. But for me, it also reinforces the need of regional and local strategies combined. We have been using this path when we are looking at our FEMA grants, when we are working on those um, additional um, enhancements on the primary system. We are sitting down in Miami to see what else is needed in the secondary system so we can make an integrated project looking at regional and local systems at the same time. This is the format that actually FEMA has been recommended. Of course, there is no, no planning effort that we are just um, exacerbating flood conditions anywhere in the system in any neighborhood. So in, in, as, part, as we plan for those projects, we are definitely looking at neighborhoods in general on all the sides and especially downstream. So, but I think we need more of those combined strategies like regional and locally. Yeah, to the gentleman's point, we're currently, the permitting agencies, including the Water Management District and then the other local agencies that are permitting these pump stations, generally speaking, it's one inch a day. And I can tell you that our infrastructure task force after the April event demanded that we put in pump stations that could pump 10 inches a day. And we had to explain to them that no, we can't get that permitted. But I think the other, the other point here is that to think that everyone can permit one inch a day without looking at how many people are feeding into the system is going to lead us down a path where we're, again, picking winners and losers of, oh, it's too bad you're a gravity system because there's five communities upstream that are pumping away, and they're, they're going to win. And this is not new. We saw this in the April 1999 um, rain event uh, between Pembroke Pines and the South Drainage District, South Broward Drainage District, that somebody had a pump and somebody didn't, and the person who had a pump won. Um, so those communities stay flooded for a long time. But I think it's important that the permitting agencies are starting to come in here and realizing that there's not unlimited capacity for everyone to just start putting a pump in. But that is the current plan to protect these communities moving forward to the extent that we can afford it. Um, so with all these areas being highly populated, are we, and the limitation to pump downstream with the canal sizes, et cetera, are we considering buying land, condemning properties? It's, an, it's not a something that's favorably looked at, but maybe looking at areas where we can purchase properties and then create storage. Because that interim storage until the system opens up is really key to being able to then get the water and then move it out of the system once the main system is open again. And there are locations you can do that and there are locations that you can't. One of the things that I showed during my presentation was the groundwater table. I mean. There's no storage when the groundwater table is saturated, literally saturated right to the surface. That's always, that's always the conundrum is when you're talking surface water, you can't store enough on, on above ground. You'd need way too much space. And, and that's where the break point is. So where are you gonna find the space to actually store enough water to attenuate your high water conditions until you get a low tide to let it go? So if you're looking for buying properties, you need 
you almost need a California aqueduct situation. Yeah, secret to one reservoir. We have been, we also simulated those as part of the C8, C9 adaptation mm -hmm. study. Yeah. We had a number that was recommended initially there, which is 500 acres of small distributed storage, which gives a very little contribution to the overall reduction of the stormwater volumes that we have there. But it's certainly a strategy that we have to be further exploring. So this was one of the recommendations that we have there, really looking for any possibility of storing. But again, knowing that this is one little piece and a joint I mean, a combination of several different initiatives is what we need. But certainly, finding land and storing this tree belief in the system. Carolina, I just want, want to chime in because this is where we start getting into water quality issues. And being that that's my thing, <laughs> um, and having been, a, having been a former water manager here um, back 20, almost 20 years ago, it's evident that we can't move water the same way anymore and we're not gonna be able to pump our way out of this. And so getting creative with urban areas, getting creative with partners, the Water Management District and the Army Corps of Engineers, I mean, we really need to start thinking outside the box. We're not there yet. Um, we're piloting a couple of different things, primarily to prevent um, you know, nutrient pollution entering Biscayne Bay, which is now um, our economic study was just updated and is now worth a combined $64 billion. So it's a, a, an important asset that we can't just keep polluting into. And so um, this is where I think groups like this and forums like this are important, but we need to go beyond just kind of talking and planning and, and, data, and data sets. We really need to start implementing solutions now. Yeah. We do have one grant looking at those um, technologies that might help us on removing some of those pollutions, especially in, in the basins where we discharge to Biscayne Bay. We are testing three technologies. The initial conversations are all showing a very significant limitation in terms of volume capacity. Uh, so again, but we are gonna continue to do that. This is really, we have those three projects right now and we should be investing in more of those testing. I think we, we also need to, we, we talk about the compact and everything else, but regionally, how can we work with each other um, finding ways to move water around the system? Because it's all a connected system. Yeah, at the end of the day, some areas have more land than others. And so I think, again, this is where innovation technology and the private sector come in. So I know there, some of them are sitting out there. <laughs> yes, we definitely need more technology here too. Um, thank you for sitting. I was going to say, I think we are already in the t uh, t round table discussion. So one thing that we thought as an initial point, again, we talk about data that we're going to be collecting more and more, and we're going to discuss that. We talk about our planning efforts. We have a series of uh, planning efforts and projects that are moving towards implementation at this point. Uh, but here we are trying just to focus on how we, we can operate the system better under today's conditions, under today's infrastructure. So um, one point that we identified during that event uh, was can we map critical elevations in the system so that our water managers, as if, can have those numbers clearly ahead of him, in front of him, when they are, make, when they are making all those decisions to be able to, I mean, upstream we also have limitations. Some inches up in the primary canal upstream will also prevent communities upstream to discharge in the same canal that communities downstream are not able to discharge. So it's, it's a whole system, it's a whole system limitation. We need to be able to find the balances there and the, it depends on each event, on each circumstances. And, and again, the vulnerability of all those communities, but reading those critical levels, both upstream and downstream will be useful so we can, again, seek to optimize the operations, seek to optimize those discussions. So that was something that we agree um, in preparation for this meeting that we would like to be able to map with your input. So I am thinking about, uh, like I know um, Albert mentioned, I believe the number was 5.2, Albert, uh, during that specific event as a, as, a, as a limitation that they wanted to maintain in their canal. Is this something that, you all agree it's a good 
first step. Can we, is this something that we can really map with good, I would say, I know there are going to be some considerations and assumptions in each of, when we set a number, it's not just one number. We're gonna to have to kind of write some assumptions along with that, but is this uh, a good first step for us to kind of take out of this meeting, do this uh, coordinated effort with all Broward communities, Miami-Dade communities as well. We, we, we know we have some critical levels there too. And I think that would inform, in general, all the additional planning efforts that we have, not just the, I mean, the operations that we might need to, to look at today. So input on that, any question or input? Um, if I understand correctly, I think that's a great idea. If we had sort of a live feed of elevations distributed, I think it would be um, really useful in being able to determine um, gates opening and closing, um, maybe helping uh, get a better view overhead of all the communities. Go ahead. Carolina, are you, are you looking for, um, I, I see there's two issues. One is land elevation, uh, so that we don't want the waterways to reach a land elevation that they end up starting to overflow their banks. Um, the other one is the elevation of the actual inlet that once the inlet is covered, it can no longer discharge. What elevations do you think would be most useful for what you're asking for? That was going to be my next question. Right now, please, Ann Albert, confirm with me. The 5.2 number we were discussing on the call is the elevation downstream of our coastal structure. Yes. So because you have the understanding of the system, you know what that elevation at downstream of our coastal structure means to the overall area downstream, right? Susan might be able to the microphone. It's not. Oh, okay, got it. Uh, it, it the, the Sleepy River pump station is actually 3.75. That's our discharge restriction going into the Middle River. Okay. So if we go, if, if the, the, the static elevation on the downstream side is lower th or above that, we can't turn on our pumps. So that, that's a restriction. So, and, and that is, we can, at our station, that we have the ability to monitor both the upstream and downstream side. So we can get that data. I think, Nancy, I think probably saw, at least on the Middle River, there's several bridges that if you want to get some static elevation, that you could probably use those bridges uh, and other bridges along the New River and other. But it's, there's so many canals between Oakland Park and, and uh, Fort Lauderdale and even Wilton Manors. Who knows which canal is going to be the governing factor? We're just looking at the district. It would be the Middle River up to the U.S. 1, and then you're into the intercoastal waterway, would be a good uh, exercise, at least on the C-13 Middle River Canal. So yeah, I, I would even ask Asif if he has a question, but I think what we need the numbers, we need the numbers that our water managers, we will understand that they, how they can act. So I'm thinking the downstream elevation of our coastal structures is the number we are seeking for at this point, but you need to, uh, to have an understanding of what that level gets to your whole system downstream. So we can start monitoring by that one point. We talked today about not having readily like available water levels on the whole system. So we would have to kind of derive from that elevation downstream, what did that mean to you all in your entire system? And I mean, if we need to look at other critical points a little bit further from our downstream elevation, we're gonna to have to establish a process that, of course, we have readily available information for that point as well, so we can be monitoring. I mean, uh, the water managers would need somehow this, um, this elevation to be informed to them at real time. It occurs to me that a low-tech solution is for the cities to choose a couple of critical locations and put in staff gauges that can be read during critical events to say this waterway is currently at X. And I showed a picture of, of one that was uh, in the North Fork of the New River. Um, but the long term, especially during a major event, is to have it be an automated remote opportunity. But again, the low-tech opportunity will still start to inform us about 
when we can't discharge and when we're starting to see problems. Most of the stuff that we manage county water control districts are in the north county. It's not coastal particularly, but it's not too far west either, so it's kind of central. We have the low-tech solution, which is the hard staff gauges, and we, we have, I think we've got 56 of them all over the place. Now, when we run into a rain event, we only have a small number of them that are close to structures that we send the guys out to look at and record. It takes them two and a half hours to do the circuit before we start getting information back. Uh, one of the things that I'm a proponent of a low-tech system is that when you lose power, you suddenly have no access to that electronic. But what I'm now thinking, and this is just a thought that is occurring to me now, if someone would host some sort of a, a, an, a data uptake that we could all then sign in on and automate, some of our elevations, that might solve some of your data gap issues. We have been trying to build that kind of system with flood images to begin with. <laughs> and we have been having a lot of trouble even to get to, it, it, we seem it's going to be something obvious, but we are finding so many kind of walls along the way that is kind of, well, yeah. Security issues yeah. Yes, yes, certainly. Uh, but in the, in the conversation with USGS, those rapid uh, RDGs, rapid deploy, deployment gauges, seem to be something that uh, can quickly talk to the system, to our system. Yes, we, are, we don't have the money PCF. <laughs> they are delaying to provide us with the number. But what we did is we mapped some of the critical areas that we know we have flooding. So Chris is going to talk a little bit about this effort that we did to identify um, flood-prone areas based on a series of um, um, reports, flooding reports that we compiled during the summer. We had an intern doing this work for us during the summer, assist, incredible work, mapping everything, all the past events, areas from our knowledge that were flood-prone. And then we kind of proposed to locate some of those uh, solutions in a few of those areas. So that might be an initial path to, I mean, in addition to the points right downstream of our coastal structures, we could have a few other locations and partner to have this uh, rapid deployment gauges set up there, and at least we have one more point of communication. And they speak to our SCADA system. That was the initial assessment that we were able to have. So. So yeah, I would say the, the one point downstream of the critical structures is the main one, but then also mapping some additional points in your system and the strategy that you might have to provide this data to us. Asif, do you have anything that you would like to say in terms of how you would benefit from receiving this data from the water management perspective? I, I give you alert that I would put you on the spot. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> um, no, those are all good points. Um, understanding the pain points downstream and when, and having that conversation, that coordination, and helping us understand what's happening downstream where we don't have that visibility will, will be beneficial. Perfect. So, yeah, I, I think that we're going to follow up with you all. We're going to start the effort of compiling this data. And then, of course, we might need to have a separate meeting for us to go over the strategy, how much data we collected, and discuss a little bit more if we are really going to need any additional monitoring the system. But is this okay as an initial step? Okay. Okay, so I think uh, we're going to move up to the other um, agenda item that we have today, which is very Carolina, much related to what Carolina, we're talking about. I, yes. I just want to make one of my one more anecdotal observation. 
I love when we look at the maps and we see the square water bodies, you know, we'll call lakes something. If you don't own that lake publicly, the value of that lake being filled is more than the value of its to the drainage system. And that's literally what's happening. People are filling the lakes to create the land again that we used to took the dirt out the first time to be able to build on. And Not realizing that what they're doing is removing the water storage. Absolutely, yes. because it's value of land. Yeah. And the land value is so key to all the things we're talking about. Yeah. And when I see the, you know, we're confronted, there's no real thing on the books to say, no, you can't fill in the lake if you don't own it, right? If the public yeah. owns it, it's another thing. But a lot of these lakes are not owned by the public. Yeah. They're borrow pits, right, that we call a lake. So I just think that's something to keep in mind as we go forward collectively. You know, what do we do when we're confronted by these situations? Yeah. I have no doubt that creating room for the water is what we need to in any aspect in the system. So the, the feeling of the lakes is definitely something that is very concerning as well. We're going to have to, uh, I mean, as we look for 500 acres of distributed storage in a basin, in one of our basins, uh, we, can, we, we need to, to have this message out that any room for the water in those basins are going to be critical in the future. And again, because of the conversation we just had here, we cannot just pump everything out. Part of the solution will also be trying to hold as we can. I have one final statement. We also need to be conscious of when we lose that surface water, we're losing that connection to the ground and the recharge that we need to run our well fields for our water supply part. Because one day all this rain is gonna stop and we're gonna go through a dry period. And then we're all gonna take this conversation back to the 1990s and we're going to talk about drought. We're going to talk about how we can recharge the groundwater. Yeah. So, we are looking at a, the dry. It's a fine line. <laughs> it's not that the rain will stop one day. We're going to have more rain on the wet, less rain on the dry <laughs> season. So this is already kind of, we're seeing a little bit of that. Uh, and we are ca carefully monitoring those numbers as well. So, um, okay, I think we're going to move to the next agenda item, unless we have any other final comment. I'm looking around one more time. We certainly will schedule a little bit more conversation on that. But we do have an, um, an item here uh, that is we were trying to kind of close our wet season. This item was planned way before the rainfall event that just happened. So, but a lot of what we have been doing and we're going to be reporting here in terms of data, collecting data, getting access to real-time information as soon as possible, and even silly photos that might seem to be not aggregating a lot of information can be very helpful. So we're going to kind of share a little bit the efforts that we did to, one, create this flood-prone area database that we are needing input, two, to collect as more, more data as possible and get this data uh, transmitted to the, water managers, to the water managers as soon as possible, and then also to make this data available to all, all of you that also want to have access and kind of um, be able to use this data for your for your purposes. So Chris has been doing an incredible job leading those efforts, and she's going to start with that, and then we're going to talk about the king uh, type data collection. But now it's the wet season flood observation collection. Good afternoon. Um, whoops, sorry. Um, I think the last time we were here um, in the Resiliency Forum, we handed out a flood brochure and we talked about um, a flood survey and um, that we wanted the resiliency partners in South Florida to participate in um, submitting flood observations. Um, what this map on the brochure represents is the work that has been done by district staff as well as Aziz to look at resources that have been collected in the past and also look at web resources um, to determine where do we have documentation of events that resulted in flooding. What the next step that Aziz is going is um, our meteorologists have identified a resource that allows us to go back and get some more um, information about these events as well as expand on those events. So that'll be the next chapter of that work that Aziz is doing to further um, expand our history of um, events resulting in flood and where the, which areas were impacted. Um, another initiative that we um, 
uh, started during um, Hurricane Ian was a discussion with a company um, called ISI. Um, they are a satellite data provider. They collect synthetic aperture radar data, and they work worldwide to focus their um, satellite constellations on areas where there are events unfolding, fire, flood, and other such events. And based on what we saw in the data we purchased for Ian, which I'm going to share with you now, um, we decided to um, enter into a subscription service with them where we get notifications. I get daily notifications of where there's events occurring worldwide. This started, unfortunately, right after the November um, 14th, 16th, event. So I do have an email out to try to see if they did capture imagery for that event so that we can look at flood extent. For those not familiar with radar data, radar data can be collected through clouds. So it's a very effective, if you've got the satellite constellation in the right place and targeted at the right events, it's a very effective way to capture water surface um, in using the data. We have to be careful to differentiate water surfaces that naturally occurring versus water surfaces that are associated with flooding. In this area, we are showing we actually got imagery at the peak surge um, during Ian on the southwest coast. So the extent you see here is the extent that was captured by the ISI um, satellites. Um, what ISI does is they'll, they'll capture over a period of time. In this case, they captured from November 26th through um, uh, October 10th, and then they look at the flooding recorded and they produce a raster that represents the maximum extent of the flood in areas over that period, and they calculate depth. So they actually come up, you can actually calculate a volume um, from that. Um, the red uh, triangles are the USGS and UCF high water marks that were collected. Those were used to validate the collection or very Useful. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about high water marks. I've talked about it yesterday. I'm a high water mark advocate, and I think high water marks are something that um, we all need to start focusing on and collecting them because they can help really inform um, when there's flooding, um, what the extent is, and what the recurrence is. Um, here is the ISI data collected in the Kissimmee Basin. I have processed this to remove, I call it my water management district mask. Um, in the coastal areas, I have a coastal mask, so I'm just trying to get um, where water is on the terrestrial plane, which we would then categorize as flooding. So this is the extent of ISI measured um, water extent on the terrestrial area outside of our water management system associated with Hurricane Ian. There was also some data collected in southeast Florida. These did not have high water marks. We have the data. The data is less trustworthy because we did not have any measurements on the ground to validate um, the depths measured by ISI. We also have a capture in Key West. So when there is an event that's large, like Ian, which is really difficult for us to understand, where there is flood occurrence, we now have a resource that can assist us in doing so. So the next part of this was, um, is there value to doing ISI? We have a gauge network. Does, does what informs us more, a satellite um, collection or our gauge network? So um, I looked at this, um, ISI did not, ISI is focused on urban areas and we are talking to them about, like in the Kissimmee Basin, everything goes downstream. So for us, in, during that event, we were trying to understand the total volume of rainfall that was coming our way into the water management system. So we have informed ISI that we really want them to consider um, capturing um, a larger footprint and getting our natural areas that are connected with our system. Part of subscribing with them is informing them about our system and giving guidance as to what is helpful to us and beneficial to us in receiving their data. What you'll note here is that there are two shades of color here. There is a purple, and there is a pink, and there is a blue. The, let me make sure I got my colors right. So they didn't show up real well. Um, so the, Okay, green. Green on the map is your FEMA flood lines. 
Purple is derived from the maximum stage measured in that lake system. So I took the maximum recorded during from 926 to 1030, and I created, I used a bathtub approach to create a surface, and I compared that with what ISI captured. What our gauge network did was did a better job than ISI at getting that flooding that we got um, south of, at the discharge of Lake Hart, but it did not capture the watershed flooding that occurred in the um, western portion of the Toho Basin. In the Toho Basin, it did a good job. Our stage data allowed us to see where we saw flooding along the lake shore, but it did not capture that flooding. We saw Mill Slough and other inflow areas into Lake Toho. In the Lake Gentry area, it, um, our stage data really didn't tell the story. Instead, ISI captured the watershed flooding, and the same was the case in S63A, where we were struggling to get water out of Lake Gentry because we had so much local inflows into the canal, we were trying to get an understanding of that. So this data would have told us what volume we're looking at that's coming in that's going to restrict our ability to discharge out of Lake Toho, I mean Lake Gentry, when we were pumping water out of um, Preston, Hart, uh, Joel, and Myrtle instead of sending it to Hart into Alligator, and then we couldn't get it out of Alligator into Gentry. So I think the ISA data um, demonstrated um, its usefulness, at least in the Kissimmee Basin for this event, um, because we can do bathtub analysis with um, lake stages. Um, I want to show the water managers at some point the um, Packingham Slough area and the story to be told by the ISI data in the Packingham Slough area um, associated with the G700A structure. Um, what, uh, so that's just ISI data. That's something that we're working on acquiring to share with our resiliency stakeholders. I'm going to talk a little bit about our next steps and um, how we want to utilize that data and share that data with you. It is licensed data that it's not open for us to share. We can share some derived product data. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that. In the effort that Carolina has requested with regard to flood observations, we're building a flood documentation database. What you saw the first slide was the history of flood observations, but we now have several layers that we're moving forward, and I'll show you the web map. We're coming up with an application and a hub, and I'll show you a little bit. All of this is under development, but Carolina wanted me to show you what's under development, and then we'll be bringing you versions as we stand this up. So we are worked, we want to work with partners to collect survey observations. I'll show you the flood survey. It's been shown to you before. We didn't get a lot of reports in these areas that um, people have discussed today. So that was as I was, as each of you were talking, I was also comparing that with our flood prone areas, which was based off the documentation of these events. I don't have a lot of recurring documentation of Dania Beach. It sounds like it's a routine, regular thing. So I think that when you look at our data that we've pulled together, we need your help in making it more robust and giving us information. I am going to take all of your slide presentations and what you put on those and translate that into our flood documentation of this no-name event. But this is the type of collaboration and cooperation we're looking for as far as your, contribu your contribution to our flood documentation database. The second layer we have in there is our high water marks. We modeled our high water mark survey off of the state survey. We're just not using the state survey because the, um, the logistics of getting accounts set up with Daniel Rydell is just a lot for us, so we just matched his survey and we can submit the data to him. We do also get from the state EOC the USGS high water marks when there's an EOC activation. But I know that there's a lot of high water marks out there that we don't have that I'd be very interested in getting and adding so that we do have a repository of high water marks that we can utilize um, for flood documentation in South Florida. The flood extent I just showed you, 
We're looking at different ways of doing that, either through remote sensing, eyesight being one of them, or deriving in areas where it's appropriate to do bathtub analysis, um, surfaces associated with our, um, our gauge measured um, water levels. Uh, and ultimately what we're trying to do is define these flood prone areas to focus and concentrate our efforts for additional monitoring with the USGS or in reconnaissance post event to deploy our teams in order to understand where the flood is occurring and where the flood is recurring. So the hub that we are, dun, da, 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 we're gonna see if this works. Um, dun, da, da. We have tested this so many times. Do you know what we did? We tested it on the, um, I've got control down. I think we need to end the slideshow. Or do I need to do my alt tab? Yes, your alt tab. Alt tab. There you go, this one. No, that's not the one, the, uh, that's not linking my, that's not opening up my new link. It's just pointing at my link. But I will go here, so we can just. Which one you wanna open? I wanna open this one. Okay. But I think we have to exit the presentation because it worked when we were out of the presentation. Yeah. Okay. Yep, let's do that. Okay, so um, welcome to the South Florida Flood Information Resource. This is a um, hub site uh, which we are, are initiating. It's not yet publicly available. It is going, it's a community site, which means that people can apply for or can create a community account. What that means to the resiliency partners here is that if you want to contribute or share information with the resource, um, your account can be elevated to a role that can be a contributor to the site. Um, it can also be elevated to a role that can gain access to licensed data and licensed services. Um, you would have to assign an agreement at that time if you were to get that access, but that is where we're headed and the ISI data is one of the data sets that would be require um, elevation and an agreement to abide by the license that the um, Water Management District has signed with ISI. This is intended to be a repository. We were talking yesterday in the Miami-Dade meeting about having a central place to go and find applications. Um, ideally, because we're a regional authority and we want a place for ASEF and the other water managers to go to find information, we'd like for this hub to serve as a place where you can provide those. So it's not just providing them to within your organization or your county, we are providing a resource that you can get a community account, we can elevate it to a role where you can contribute to and help us build a resource for others to use. What we have there so far, there's a public facing aspect of this and there's a non-public facing. So for when you have like tools that have a client view versus a public view because we're dealing with the sensitivity of flood information, you could get a community account that's elevated to a place that allows you to see certain information that the public will not be able to see. Next year, our plan is to make our, um, our flood survey um, public. We know that others have flood surveys um, and we don't wanna compete with those flood surveys, but we are trying to provide a means to get this information to the people that need it. And ideally, what Carolina was talking to me about the November event, she's going, Chris, there are canals flooding. There are canals overtopping. People are saying this, but we don't know exactly where it is. Ideally, somebody could go out to this, document the flood. You can use it on your phone. It, it will take your location. You can submit a photo as well as other information. And then we can look on our map, which I'm gonna show you next, and we can go, oh, that's exactly where this observation is. And we can pull up that picture and we can see exactly what's there. So the, um, the other resource that we do make available on our hub for, and I'm sorry, this is a little bit difficult for me to manage, there we go. The other resource, which isn't live linked right now for the public is this who to contact. This is a carpet across the um, South Florida Water Management District that identifies the municipality, the county, 
or the special district that's responsible for responding to flooding in that area, when you click on it, I'm gonna go here now. When you go to this site, the public can enter their address. Oh, I can't see when I'm typing. This, the, did I get it, 3301 Gun Club Road? And what we get here, and I'm just gonna slide this one over, is I find out the information on who to contact. And I can, if I'm on a mobile device, I can click on any of these things to either make a direct call or go to the website um, for that. Um, we will be having a link on this that um, will also be a link to the flood survey. So if somebody at that point in time wanted to know both who to contact and they wanted to then report the flooding that they're observing at that point that they're calling about, they could do that. And ideally then, um, if you have a secured account and you go to, to the application that we're putting up, someone could go into the here and click on an observation. Oh, I wish I could see. And they would see the information submitted as well as the pictures related to flooding. So this is a resource that would be available on the secured site that would allow you to access the information related to flood observations. Um, this is um, the area shown here in yellow are what we've identified as um, preliminarily as um, flood prone areas. You'll see Dania is not. And then some of the areas we were talking about in the Oakland Park area are not. And so I got the impression today that that is not the case. Um, so I think that uh, we need um, help. We can, we'll release this to you guys. We need help identifying where we're deficient in our identification of flood prone areas. And maybe there's areas we have based on storm documentation, identified them as flood prone when that's really not the case. So we are looking for your, impact, your input um, to help us build this. So I'm going to go back to this and put this in presentation mode. And um, so for 2024, we're looking to open the flood observation service to the survey to the public so that we can get broader support and we can get encouragement from resiliency partners to have the public contribute. Um, we want to encourage resiliency partners to learn how to mark and measure um, and submit high water marks to us so that we can begin building a better regional um, picture of where um, of, of flooding and documented flooding that can be used in model validation and for other purposes like estimating flood surfaces. And we can also use this information to coordinate with the USGS to identify locations to um, deploy sensors or potentially for the water management district to consider um, locating additional sensors. I'm gonna say one last thing before we go to, there was a lot of discussion just now on that critical um, elevations and um, pain points and where the, you have state staff gauges located. I think all of that, Carolina, would be something that we should consider maybe putting a survey out where um, resiliency partners were willing to map that stuff. So it would just be one of those things where you would go in and put a point on a map and tell us this is a survey gauge or this is a pain point or this is um, the elevation there because you guys seem pretty comfortable with technology and um, because several people today have just gotten on my map or um, we've seen presentations. So if there is a comfort level with that, please let Carolina know and maybe we can put something together so that we can begin compiling that and then making it available within um, the, the South Florida Flood Resiliency Resource. With that, I'll turn it over to Carolina. Do you wanna, I know we are late, do you wanna go straight to the other presentation and make questions at the end? Are we okay? So, because the next one is quick. 
And the reason this one is going to be quick is because I'm presenting on behalf of uh, Todd Kimberlin, our me meteorologist. Unfortunately, he was not able to be here with us today. And um, he would do, a, I'm, I'm sure, a 10 times better job than I'm going to try to do here today. I'm really feeling big shoes, and I am a little uncomfortable to have to present this alone. But anyway, I, I'm going to do my best to go through these slides. I will probably go quicker than he was going to do because I would, I would try my best to get all the information that we have in this presentation here. But along with us collecting data in general during flood events, of course we have the king tide season um, and I would say kind of some anticipated flooding that we might occur. So we are using that king tide season to better understand where we are, water levels throughout the system, but also to almost like uh, train our capacity to collect data, collect information, transmit this information to us. So in 2023, we did significant efforts towards like really navigating throughout this king tide season and enhancing our collection tools, enhancing our communication tools. So the very one first thing we did was to create this king tide forecast. Uh, it's basically a bulletin. We, um, we had provided this update every Monday uh, throughout the king tide season. And the, the information that this um, um, bulletin brings to you, in addition to traditional NOAA, and I know we have 100 sources of data out there talking about King Tide events. So the, the thing we're bringing this time is uh, an enhanced forecast. So we partnered with the UM, and we were successfully in getting some of this data already this year. It was not even on the plan to have this um, formally being shared uh, during the season, but the team at the UM were so effective in, in making sure that we were able to advance those tools and those initial enhanced forecasts that we brought this to the, those um, bulletins from the very beginning. These are still draft products. Of course, we are going through review, form review, enhancement, but these, the data that was provided through this enhanced forecast seemed to be very valuable. It provided us a little bit better information on forecasting for king tides. So basically what the data does is, on top of the NOAA predictions on those king tides, it also looks at other meteorological factors, so wind, um, wind direction, sea surf temperature, sea level pressure, and any other major weather systems. So again, our team of meteorologists have the capacity to be able to look at those pieces, and the model that they built in collaboration with UM uh, is uh, looking at all those factors and seeing if any of those will enhance the conditions during king tide. And then, of course, um, um, swells in general, like oceanic um, um, swells and other tropical storms that might be coming and having an influence on the, on the king tide occurrence. So, of course, we understand that those coastal areas are the ones in, um, with the risk of potential flooding during those events. So we also map. So at the bulletin, we identify based on where we are seeing those conditions, we identify what, which areas are mostly being impacted during this specific King Tide event. So we did uh, send out those communications. The last one was sent this Monday. If you didn't receive, um, we have a link there for you to sign up. But anyway, we're, we're gonna be stopping this for this season, resuming again um, on, in 2024. Uh, but anyway, we had this, um, this uh, season well documented. Uh, we're going to send a wrap-up of the season um, uh, to you all so you can follow what we, we provide in terms of information. Um, so, again, I just want to reinforce that all this information was compiled based on the work from uh, Todd Kimberlin, our lead meteorologist, and also Mark uh, Nissenbaum, our senior meteorologist. And we work very closely with the UM team, which I'm going to talk a little bit here now through this partnership. So the partnership, as I said, was to enhance, to, to build on top of the NOAA title predictions. Uh, the project was kicked off December last year, and um, we, again, as I said, the goal was not to really give this all the outputs uh, already this year, but they were able to produce those forecasts for, for us already in this year. They were using mainly the American model. Uh, we are also purchasing additional European models, so in the next cycle, I hope I'm not saying anything wrong, but I believe in the next year we're going to combine American and European models for those forecasts, and we're going to include that in the, in the predictions. So again, this is dynamic model inputs that account for all the factors, sea level rise and tidal conditions associated with meteorological and oceanic factors. And um, 
everything, once the product is near completion, we are about midway through the contract, we are going to incorporate all those forecasts and the information into the resilience, the existing resilience metrics hub. And we selected six uh, locations. So this is where those forecasts will be produced for. So the map shows uh, them there. So it's Naples, QS, um, Vaca Key, Virginia Key, Port Everglades, and Lake Worth. So those are the six, six locations we're gonna have those enhanced forecasts. Just as I said, they, they brought in those products quickly and we were able to do some initial comparisons on what these draft products did in terms of forecasting those conditions. So what we see there um, on, the, on the left side, um, so the NOAA, so this is error, this is just an error image. So the red line is the error, be, be, um, the error from the NOAA projection versus the, um, the, what we observed during that event. So in the green and yellow, which are overlap on the left there, we have NOAA plus sea level rise and NOAA plus additional elements that they have there. And again, this is beyond my capacity to explain all the elements, but the green and the yellow are really NOAA accounting for the sea level rise and the error, of course, is less. But then our forecast comes in the blue line there and we are seeing that the error from the, call, the forecast is even better. So we are really enhancing our capacity to predict those, those, those peaks uh, from King Tide. And, the, and this is shown on number of days in advance of the event. So when, of course, one day off before the event, we have a very precise, like less error. And we, as with 10 days, we have a little bit more um, error on the projection. Similarly, uh, on the right side, we are seeing the same thing, just zoom in a little bit. And the, the dash lines on the bottom are just uh, biased. This means we are under predicting. So both NOAA and our forecast are still under predicting some of those observations. But again, good results, promising um, technology here that are helping us to get a little bit more in understanding those peak king tides. Um, in 2023, we had just two king tide events considered low to moderate significance according to a, a threshold that was established by NOAA. So on September 29 and October 3rd, we had the highest peak of the season. We were able to collect 50 records. So we basically had our team going out to the field and collecting some observations. And October 30th and 31st was the second time we sent our team out. It was a full, full a king time um, event and we collected 29 records. Uh, of course, we did it closer to our coastal structures that was there was a little bit of the focus of this effort this year, and we have to thank the GIS team for working with us. They train our field staff from all the, um, so we had Fort Lauderdale, Miami, Homestead, West Palm, and Okeechobee field station staff trained to be able to go out and observe those uh, conditions and also even go further and collect high water marks. Chris has been uh, very kind of insisting on the high water mark because that's the way she can validate a lot of the data there too. So they're able to go and, and not only collect, uh, send us photos, but also start collecting some of those high water marks. I think you saw this, those were the peaks for this year. So less one occurring uh, on Monday this week. Just quickly going through some of what we uh, monitor during the event. So for this first classic King Tide event here between September and October 4th, um, this was what, um, the UN professor, Dr. McNody, uh, published uh, and went out in social media for the very first time. So it was one of the very first uh, forecasts there. And you can see the blue CN light being the model forecast, predicting a little bit more of the peaks that really over, that they went over the minor flooding threshold. So again, those forecasts were enhanced better than the NOAA ones, gave us a little bit better information, and pointed the time of the days that we were gonna see those king tide um, or exceeding the minor threshold, flooding threshold line. Those lines, again, were determined by NOAA. Here is just uh, from just the NOAA data, what, what they were predicting and what was observed. So again, seeing a little bit of a gap in, uh, on between what NOAA was predicting and what was observed. Similar here. And this is uh, the bulletin. So this is what our meteorologists are, are, are released on that week. So that's what the information that we are being publishing. So it's a brief summary of the title of Outlook, summarizing for that specific week, what's gonna happen. Is there any wind? Is there any swell? Is any other condition that exacerbating that? So this is published every week to all of you. And during this kind of king tide event, this is a little bit of what we observed there in terms of king tide flooding. 
So, um, I, and, like, this was the one that I was hesitant to bring when I spoke to Todd earlier this week. This only represents the sea surf temperature. So throughout the season, we also observed that the, high, that the temperature of the ocean was higher. There were some anomalies there. That contributes to thermal expansion of the water there and, of course, a little bit further exacerbating king tide impacts. So that was one of the contrib contrib contributing factors for that event and also the wind conditions. So just showing in a map what, you, you, what was, was being brought to those events. Here quickly, one minor king tide event. Again, the forecast and the sea and line there showing um, some of those uh, peaks. Um, minor flooding across southwest Florida. One more event, king tide event. There was a full moon on October 26th. Our bulletin again for that event. The forecast from UM uh, in partnership with the South Florida Water Management District there. Here, a little bit more intense on that event. Um, the forecast during that time in, for Virginia Key was really um, uh, surpassing the moderate flooding threshold line for that specific event during the late October. And finally, one last one that we have here that was the king tide early in November, um, breezy northwest wind after a frontal pa passage. Here, just minor contributing factors, but again, some of the um, the observed flooding, really surpassing minor flooding um, events. And um, yes, the f and I think he added those additional ones at the end, which will bring us the, the more recent event that was very well documented uh, today on those additional presentations just showing the November 15, 16 King Tide event and conditions that exacerbated that too. So, wind as um, Nancy presented in her presentation. So also uh, really keeping those king tide longer uh, on that event. And this is Edgewater in Miami. I know we didn't have any Miami um, presentation here today, but we, we saw significant impacts also in Miami area. So in summary, um, uh, our weekly tidal outlook um, really anticipated those elevated tidal levels that cause minor to moderate flooding in this fall 2024, looking at king tide solidly. Of course, I'm not talking about a uh, rainfall event in this bullet. Um, we issued two special outlooks, so it's every Monday, but if we see an exacerbating condition that we have to uh, issue another bulletin in the middle of the week, we'll do it. This year, we, we issued twice. So. Uh, be alert to that too if any condition ex is as further exacerbating what was documented on Monday. We're going to issue um, or extraordinary ones. So those tidal outlooks are really meant to provide a, a broad summary of those tidal conditions and, and really will contain even more additional information into the future. We are going to be covering the West Coast a little bit more frequently now that the Naples tidal forecast uh, is operational and we are uh, running the models for that as well. And um, we want to be able, as part of the future goals, to be more comprehensive and, and more probabilistic outlooks. Um, as we have uh, one anticipated uh, effort is that we might be seeing uh, those uh, conditions, king tide conditions, exacerbated even beyond the normal king tide season. So we are flexible to, of course, uh, respond and be able to issue those um, outlooks. Um, outside of the normal official king tide season, and we're anticipating that that might occur in the future. So, okay, I'm going to open for questions. I know it was a lot of information, but it just show our kind of efforts here in collecting data, making information available, building a consolidated database of flooding information to you all, and mostly uh, really counting with your support so we can continue on that path. Any questions? Any Comments? Yes, yes. The, news, the newsletters have been helpful. Um, I spent a lot of time looking at King Tide data and trying to figure out why it's not doing what it's supposed to be doing. And the newsletters have been helpful in informing why we're looking at anomalies and how long the city can anticipate that the King Tide will go beyond what the, the NOAA initial prediction is. Excellent. We have actually uh, Dr. McNody from UAM on the line, and I believe Todd might be on the line too, so I'm sure they will be happy to hear that the, the, the forecasts they are giving are, are being very useful to you all. And thank you, taking advantage of this. Thank you very much, UAM, and for partnering with us in this initiative.
Okay? Any other question? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send you all a lot of homework, a list of homework, to, so we can continue to, to, to uh, advance those efforts. With that, I'm going to go to our last item. It's a, a brief update on the CNSF study. You're going to invite Jenny? Could I ask one quick question? Oh, I apologize. I miss. Uh, yes. Well, I actually wanted to ask a question about the ISI. Yes. Um, I was just curious how often is ISI taking snapshots and if those are available at all to us? So you said ISI is an Sorry. ISI captures under um, natural disaster conditions. So they have a team of um, meteorologists and others that are, like for us, we're interested in flood. So the, the, we are interfacing with their meteorological specialist and they're observing worldwide le weather and um, projecting when there may be a significant event that they should redirect their satellites to. So it's not that they are continually, they are continually collecting on a worldwide basis, but their focus is on capturing these specific events and delivering that information within that event window to their customers. So that, that, that's the one basis. For the resiliency partners, um, as we, the, when there is an event unfolding, we receive notifications. And if it's happening within our area of interest, we should be receiving um, preliminary releases of that information. Um, at the end of it, um, they're accumulating the data, and then there's a product that if we see it as beneficial, we would purchase it. And that purchased product is the compilation of the full extent validated against some high water marks. And for us, what we have um, said is, is that we would make it available to our resiliency partners through our flood resiliency hub that's not set up yet. What I'm finding in the, for working with the data for the first time, um, and I need to talk to ISI about, is that I'm not really utilizing, well I am, I'm taking their raster, but I've had to create this coastal map mask, and I've had to create this water management mask, and for Southwest Florida, I had to do some manual um, detention area removal, so that I was actually getting the flood. And so the product, and then I produce, which is a much easier product to work with, is a flood inundation extent. And then I will calculate a volume with that extent for different areas. Now, I don't know how that falls under the license, so I need to talk. They're going to be here, um, I guess, in the next month or two and I can talk to them about that, but that we intend to eventually make that available. I just don't know um, if you want the value-added product or the original source ISI product. Yeah, the reason I ask is because um, thinking about the um, conversation about sensors, I just wonder that if satellite imagery um, could maybe be used with computer vision to maybe do like a low infrastructure uh, method of collecting that kind of information? We've, yeah. we've been, I, we, I think it's a long conversation. <laughs> well, we've been evaluating the, the different vendors out there, like Planet is a, an evaluation we've done and there's so much cloud cover. So the, the SAR industry, the, one of the nice things about ISI, it's a four meter by four meter, which that's one of the most well, it's not the, there's, there's a lot of providers out there right now that are getting into the SAR business, but it's a matter of whether you're going to buy raw SAR, and raw SAR is not easy to process, or you're going to um, produce um, process SAR, which in this case has been um, aligned with a series of base math products as well as elevation models. So it's adjusted, and it's analysis ready. Yeah. Um, 
Like, I think we should, I, I, we have a lot on this, but, and I know we are a little bit late. So the, the message is when we talk to them and we sign up for the subscription, we sign up in a way that we can share with selected resiliency partners. We show them a list. We send them a list of local governments in 298 districts so they could understand what we, the number we were talking about. So they gave us we, the, the license we are signing as a subscription, allow us to share, but the purchase of the image when we have for each event. So the license allow us to redirect the sensors, the satellite, and the, the image we have to purchase on a discounted rate at every event. So we're going to share all those details with you. It's relatively affordable. It's not something uh, out of ordinary, and I think we're finding a lot of value on bringing this additional information. We finally found something that can go through the clouds and help us kind of mapping a little bit further. So we will certainly need a little bit of time to go over those details, but we are just a little bit late. Is that okay? And we need to determine how responsive they're going to be to our local events. And that's, I mean, if they, if, if they were monitoring, and I want to just validate because they didn't like notify us. If, if they were monitoring that event that came over South Florida, you know, if they were just watching South Florida, during that time period, I would have think when these two lows are collided and there was this projection of this rainfall, they would have done a redirect. And so that may be part of us working with them now that we're in our, we have a subscription, but we're still, I, we're in a pilot. We, we got a really good product. Now we got to work with the team and we've got to see how they're going to deliver for what we need and what you need. And the intention of it is to provide all of South Florida um, the tools they need to evaluate flood extent, flood occurrence, flood volume. Okay, our start team here from the CNSF Flood Resiliency Study. It's always good to have an update every m meeting here. So let's go. Okay. You ready? All right, we're going to sit here so Tim Geisen and I can sit together. Um, Ms. Yvette, can you bring up our slide? Excellent. Uh, so good morning. I am Jennifer Smith, the lead district project manager for the Army Corps CNSF Pl Flood Resiliency Study. Uh, Tim Geisen is the lead manager uh, for the Army Corps for this study. I'll present a very quick background, uh, noting the recent updates, next steps, and uh, project risk. So we'll get everybody out of here quickly. Uh, so first, the background, uh, the South Florida Water Management and the Army Corps of Engineers are partnering to advance the Central and South Florida Resiliency Study under Section 216 of the Flood Control Act of 1970. It will identify technically feasible, environmentally acceptable, and economically justified project recommendations to improve flood resiliency in the communities served by the CNSS system. Uh, this study will mainly focus on highly vulnerable coastal infrastructure, including uh, pumps, gates, and salinity control structures, and associated primary canals that can reduce most of this immediate flood risk in uh, Southern Palm Beach, Broward, and Miami-Dade counties. So it's very specific areas. Uh, the CNSF Flood Resiliency Study uh, passed the Army Corps Alternatives Milestone Meeting for approval in June of 2023, 2023 for the proposed project scope, schedule, and budget of $11 million. The most recent updates, uh, we are currently in the plan formulation phase, as you can see on the slide. We're mapping out metrics, will indicate success criteria. In October 2023, an in-person evaluation criteria public workshop was held uh, to obtain stakeholder feedback and recommended performance metrics in four different categories, national economic development, environmental quality, regional economic development, and other social effects. Uh, the study team also requested the public to break up into breakout sessions divided into four geographic areas and express their concerns and their opinions on our proposed study methods. This workshop was attended by 52 people in person and over 100 attendees online. Uh, they were from multiple municipalities, state and local governments, HOAs, consultants, environmental action groups, nonprofit organizations, and several universities. The next steps of this study uh, will be a compilation of all of these performance evaluation tools and metrics utilizing the feedback received at this October workshop. Uh, the examples of some of these metrics discussed were loss of wages, Loss, loss of tax revenue, property values, and Albert, your favorite, insurance impacts, uh, if they're going to be denied or obtaining insurance, transportation impacts, access to hospitals, uh, pollution, water supply, and agricultural impacts. Uh, Follow-up meetings will occur to further define performance metrics and evaluation tools. They'll be held in January 2024 with a target to finalize these tools in February 2024. 
The base condition and future without project modeling will begin in December 2023 for all four geographic reaches. reaches. The modeling is expected to be completed in early 2024. A tentatively selected plan will be presented in April 2025 with the final chief's report in September of 2026. Uh, so that basically shows where we are and proposed moving forward steps. Uh, there is a new project risk. Uh, an Army Corps rule was just developed and in, initiated in June 2023 uh, called Civil Works Cost Engineering and Required Frequency of Updating Cost Products. This rule effectively changed the percent complete design and increased it for all proposed construction me measures. So this may require additional time and funding to produce project deliverables, thus increasing the risk of meeting the proposed deadline for study outcomes to be incorporated into the publication of the 2026 Water Resources Development Act, the 2026 WARDA. So that was our proposed due date to have everything done for this study. So, of course, additional funding, but the time constraint to meet this deadline is at risk. So discussions all will be ongoing with how this rule change may affect the proposed project scope, schedule, and budget. Any questions? Anything to add? <laughs> I went fast, I know. That was a good update. Yeah, team? All right. <clears throat> if you do have any questions on the uh, new uh, regulation from our headquarters, please feel free to ask, and I'll try to expand on that. Yeah, <laughs> right now? <No>. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so essentially we've seen kind of large-scale swings. For a long time, our studies nationwide were taking a really long time, and we're at 2014, I think, passed our kind of smart planning regulation, which required that we complete our, our studies much faster and for a limited budget. However, kind of the situation we get into with that is we end up with designs that are not fully developed at the time they are authorized by Congress, and we run into a lot of cost overruns once we get into design and construction, and this is happening nationwide. So to try to combat that, this new regulation is requiring that we go to a more detailed level of design during our studies so we have a much better confidence in the cost at the end uh, once we get through construction. So that means investing more money in investigations, like geotechnical surveys, um, things like that, as well as more detailed design coming out of our studies, which of course increases time and increases budget. So that's kind of where we are, is trying to balance the smart planning requirements with these new engineering requirements to deliver our projects. So that answer your question? Yes, unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah, we are yeah. on the same page because our study has, I mean, we are talking about, we, we did a very preliminary design charrette, and we are talking about, I would guess here, and I, I'm, I'm sure I'm not exaggerating, 15 to 20 million that is required in addition to the 11 million that was already authorized for this study if you want to get to this level of design to a, I would say, not even a very comprehensive TSP. We are talking about a very targeted TSP that would require additional 20 million, 15 to 20 million, just for this CNSF. So it's, we're gonna have to find a way that we decide how we wanna proceed with that and hopefully not impact the timeline and of this study. Yes, we are, we are trying to combine all in one waiver, but I, I think this process is way Just, more cumbersome. This, this affects all core projects? Yeah. yeah, nationwide. So the issue that creates is we have a fairly limited investigations budget nationwide. So if more of that's eaten up by having to do more detailed design, that means less studies nationwide. So I think cost-wise, this is usually happens during the design phase after an authorization. So we're just now trying to figure out how do we absorb those costs before we even have an authorized project. So it's a conundrum nationwide that we're trying to figure out. Integration, do you want to touch a little bit? Sure, yeah. And I think all of our discussion today really kind of points out to what this slide is getting at. So I want to high-level context, pulling up from the specific project that, that Jenny just covered, to talking about all of the projects the Corps has going on in Broward and Dade counties. Um, why is that important? I think it's highlighted 
here, uh, the, pro the problems that we face from a community resilience perspective regionally um, are broad, complex. Uh, they're not easily solved by any one entity, and there's no one single solution to get out of all of these problems. We've talked today about local flooding issues. We've talked about the impacts of the regional system um, and all of these ongoing efforts. So really, community resilience is requires everybody working together with the common vision to be able to um, right-size projects that a local entity can support or larger projects at a regional scale. Um, such as regional water management or large-scale storage, uh, those solutions all are required. There's no one that's going to fix everything, right? So from the core perspective, what that means for us is we have a lot of projects going on that are really focused in one specific area of community resilience, whether they be coastal projects um, or ecosystem restoration projects or flood risk management projects or even port projects. They all have a, a part to play in community resilience. But as we kind of know, our water resources infrastructure connects all of them. So it only makes sense that we're trying to, when we implement projects, talk with each other. These project teams can't work in isolation and be successful. Uh, so what the integration effort is really all about is making sure that we are not only are internally talking across project teams, but that we're also communicating externally with our different non-federal sponsors, the different stakeholders that um, are counting on these projects to make sure that we're being effective not only with how we're communicating, but how we're collecting data, how we're developing uh, data sets, how we're evaluating our projects to make sure they all work together, um, or if they have potential conflicts, that we work those out ahead of time. So some of the efforts we have going on from an integration perspective, uh, just going to highlight a few things. The top bullet is integration workshops. So the goal, and I'm falling behind on this one, but trying to get integration workshops where we have our non-federal sponsors for all of these projects, plus other stakeholders, get together and talk about some of the tough issues, things like how we evaluate performance um, or how we look at environmental just justice, how our projects may function together. Um, these are all important things that we need to be talking about. So the goal is to set up recurring workshops where we can all get together. We've been doing that kind of piecemeal, um, but really want to set up a forum similar to what we're doing here, focusing on these projects with, with the uh, non-federal sponsors and other stakeholders. Now, that said, one of the efforts that is really in focus is a joint environmental justice working group. And I think we heard uh, during the FEMA presentation earlier and some of the uh, concerns brought up about how the communities were being um, identified. One of the things we want to do is utilize all of the different types of indicators, whether it be EPA or HUD or CDC um, that can identify these communities, but then also work with the local communities to make sure we're not missing anything, to make sure we have those identified, and come up with a comprehensive set of maps so all of the projects are working off one consistent set of maps when we're looking at environmental justice communities. But then beyond that, also to be able to more effectively communicate as the core with these communities for all of these projects. Piecemealing, talking about each of them individually is not very effective when you're talking, especially to the general public. They see, hey, you've got all this work going on. Let's talk about these things, how they work together, and get feedback all at one time. Let's be more efficient. So that's the, the focus of the environmental justice working group that uh, our, um, one of our economists, Del Kamesh, is kind of heading up that that work. And that's, I think, coming together pretty well. We've had some good uh, collaboration between folks from Dade County. Um, Nicole in the back of the room has been part of that effort from the Water Management District, as well as uh, the core project teams from both um, Jacksonville as well as uh, Norfolk District, who's running the Back Bay project. So that, I think, is working really well, and it's kind of how we want to move forward with collaboration. One of the other things that we're also trying to work on, uh, a few months ago, some of you probably attended, we had a public workshop talking about this integration effort and kind of updating each of the projects that we have going on. And one of the ways we want to try to more effectively communicate periodically is doing an integration newsletter to kind of update everybody on 
the ongoing projects. The feedback, um, having one forum for that was really good, so we thought this was a way we could effectively just get an update out to everybody that they can quickly go through. Uh, not everybody has days and days to participate in every project delivery team on all these projects, but I think a lot of people are really interested in what's going on. And then the last bullet that you have up here is kind of a, a, an example of how we're technically coordinating across projects, and that's a critical infrastructure database that would uh, currently being developed by folks from our Back Bay team in the Norfolk District, as well as um, some of our economists on the flood resiliency study in collaboration with uh, Christine over here from the Water Management District, to develop a critical infrastructure database that can be used by all of these projects when we're doing our economic analysis. Again, to ensure that we're using consistent methodology and have a consistent data set and we're not all using different things. So that was a lot, but I think that kind of covers some of the highlights of what we're doing and why we're doing it. And big picture, all of this kind of sets a groundwork for how we want to function once we move into the comprehensive central and southern Florida study, which will cover the entire southern part of the state of Florida. So a lot of what we're doing now is really going to set us up for success in how we collaborate uh, and, and be successful with that larger study moving forward. Yeah. We are also working on a, I know it's part of that integration, but we were invited by ERDIC to submit a full proposal for um, the modeling piece for this com comprehensive um, effort is going to be big. So we wrote a proposal to ERDIC to be able to help us in identifying modeling tools that we can perform this on a regional level. So the proposal is due today at the end of the day. I think I have two more things to add <laughs> to it. We are late on this event. But anyway, we are hoping that if we get that um, support, financial support from ERDIC, we are going to be able to at least initiate now with some funding also uh, dedicated to SAJ, that we can is, is start discussing kind of how we want to do this modeling, what tools are there, what adjustments are needed. Today, we do not have a tool that can perform this compound flooding analysis at the, um, large, at, at the regional level that we need. So hopefully, we can get that support, um, think I, energy from everybody that we can submit this proposal successfully and get this funding so we can move forward the comprehensive study. Tia, one of the things that you, you finished with, Sam, the uh, critical facilities, I, mean, I think that's the key for uh, all of us because it's, it's the things, that, it's the same facilities that are on, on the LMS or the ones that are in the state vulnerability studies. They'll call them different things, and sometimes the categories are a little different, but these are real facilities we all know need to be protected because they need to come back online in order for us to recover. And, you know, they're not... We don't have to, we don't really have to run a lot of models to figure this out. We, we need to get to it quickly, and, and that'll be a great takeaway. That's an early win, because yeah, yeah. If, if we can get those in WERDAs and, and bring back 65% federal dollars, then those dollars go, uh, you know, other, we can use the local dollars other places. So I just wanted to, I think that's a great place to focus um, and, and, and move, see how See how we can do it in an integrated way. Yeah. Um, in, in our conversations yesterday with Miami Dade, um, it was what what we're what what we're advocating is that the state has done an initial compilation of a statewide critical critical asset, and we need to compare that with what the federal data set is. And the next part of it is to really um, engage municipalities and counties into contributing to that structure. You know, that there may be adoption of some different standards that you haven't been using at a local level, but that have been, you know, designed at the state level. Um, what would be really nice is to, 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 to have local governments think about feeding. How can I best feed the statewide data set because that statewide data set is then going to be available to us to leverage in our regional activities and our federal activities. So that's just um, a big kudos to Miami yesterday in terms of the conversation and the meeting yesterday and the coordination. And I think that that was a really important thing and, and you can see its relevance to what Tim's talking about here. Yes? I have less confidence in state databases. <laughs> 
We provided information for them. Yeah, I know. <laughs> the local I governments know, provided. You, you know, we do. I'll, we'll do it. But I'm more, I'm more <laughs> interested in a regional database that you guys and we in the core all feel comfortable with. Yeah. Uh, so the minute we go to so the you know, plan, they'll be preempting us from data. I, I have a lot of confidence in this group um, at the state level um, behind resiliency, and my confidence in GIS data sets grows increasingly with Kimberly Jackson as our um, state GIO. She's, in de she's engaged at the federal level. She's very engaged at the state level. Her mission is to provide coordination and integration and access. And so that is the mission that's driving it. So yes, the, there, there may have, you may have had a bad past experience, but I encourage you to embrace and look at what the state GIO is bringing to the table, just like we see what FDEM is brought to the table with um, this new approach to the mitigation plan. That is new technology. It's an excellent tool. And that is exactly where the state GIO is trying to go. Yeah, we went, so we have, we are collecting data on critical infrastructure for three years now. Our first resiliency plan had it, we updated it, and we updated it again. And when the statewide database came to us, we did an initial comparison, it's not yet completed, but the feedback I got from the GIS team is that it's very close to what we had already compiled for during those three years. So I think they have a, a strong, if the, the municipalities provided the data for them, I think they'll have a very strong database. My comment also is that the, if, the, if the effort is driven from the state, then you have to depend on reaching out to all these people to get the cooperation. If the idea of contributing local to a state is adopted, then you can, it's, it's just like parcel data. We do a statewide parcel data um, layer. The counties that care and find value in providing that provide good data. The, the, the counties that don't have the resources or don't really know the value give us poor data. So if we can, like, we can build a strong South Florida regional critical asset database through the state if we commit as part of this team that that's our mission to build a good critical asset for our region. And we don't have to care if no one else outside of our region really contributes, but we can contribute to the statewide and get that regional database. I'm all about putting it right <laughs> <laughs> I worked in Bell right? I, I did that. It's for us to provide better regional support for you, it's so time consuming for us to go out and get all these data sets and have to process them. If someone's at least pre-processing them and then you're using them, you can let us know if there's an issue and we can inform the state. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> Do this over lunch. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, my, quest my, my question is more about back to the integration, um, which I'm a huge fan of, finally. Uh, we're doing it. Um, and this is something that I mentioned to ASA Connor when he was down here. I said, this is all great that we're all talking to each other. All these projects are talking to each other. My concern is the schedules. They're off on different schedules. And so now, and now that we're adding this other layer of extra design, you know, how far off are they throwing all these schedules? And, you know, are you guys even talking about this? Yes, we are talking about it. Yeah, it, Texas has no. got their plan approved before the design, and they have 57 billion in needs already there out for authorization, and we are so far behind in Florida. So that part is, is very annoying to think. No, but it's a good point, because they're, the projects are not all happening at the same time. It's really important that we continue talking through each phase of the planning effort to make sure that we're accounting for what's going on with the other projects. Um, so it, it's a lot of continued collaboration. So we are definitely tracking that we're off and that we've got to make a consolidated effort to really continue communication and do the best we can at each phase. But, you know, and, and I understand that, but there probably are some projects that are closer in alignment in, on schedules than others. And if you just start there and, you know, at the local level, 
you know, there's a lot we can do to advocate for that. And so maybe that's something we can talk further about. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is really kind of a, a new type of effort. So the more we can create it and make it more efficient, I'm all for that. So yeah, let's continue that discussion. I know we have a very long meeting, but I also don't want to miss the opportunity to just hear from you around the table. I know we heard from a few of you, but not all. If there is anybody that has an update that you would like to share with us uh, quickly around the table now, uh, let's go um, briefly. I, I really want to kind of hear a little bit. So I will skip the ones that talk. I don't know, Albert, do you have anything else? Susan, do you have anything else to update us? <laughs> I know you're with Albert. Uh, Terry, anything? Okay, I think everybody's hungry, but <laughs> okay. Everglades Foundation with Nashi. Anything that you want to update us? Thank you. Uh, I brief, but I also want to first comment. Thank you. I also want to commend um, the district for this forum, this opportunity, and the excellent um, uh, resilience plan that you have and. What I also uh, feel that's, which is there in the plan but not mentioned here are the environmental outcomes that we are looking for. And all our resilience is based off of that. Uh, coming from the Everglades Foundation, I want to also reiterate how the Everglades restoration is building into that, re that resilience as well as how we uh, are all um, trying to um, enhance nature-based solutions or nature-based solutions in all our resilience efforts that will bring the Everglades into the city and improve resilience for us all. Uh, another point I would like to um, really comment on is the integration plan, right? So it is, uh, like my mentor, Dr. Olson, used to say that, uh, a, and you're being entrusted with it, is how the sum of all the projects that we are building in the region is going to be greater than its parts. So, um, uh, you know, uh, congratulations on that, and we look forward to supporting you all. I had some points written out. I'd, I'd like to, uh, you know, kind of urge every one of us, as we build our risk assessments, our vulnerability <coughs> assessments, it's also going to be very important to quantify and value the enhancement of resilience that is increasing risk reduction or, uh, you know, the decrease in vulnerability of each of the mitigation projects. So mapping those would be a great uh, thing to start planning for already. So how all our risk mitigation measures increase resilience needs to be mapped, whether it's, again, uh, local projects or regional projects from SERP to CNSF to all the projects that are there. Then we need to map those. And um, thirdly, um, we need to increase the voices in the table, on the table here, so have more uh, people representing different areas for the Resilience for Forum 2. And at the Everglades Foundation, we are also trying to uh, bring to the fore more innovative and state-of-the-art economic methodologies that will help in capturing comprehensive benefits, social outcomes, as well as environmental outcomes. So any support that we can offer to you, oh, we are ready to do so. And with that, I will end my spiel. Thank you. Thank you, Menashe. Yes. Louis, good to see you. Just briefly, I just uh, Florida Department of Transportation is working on a statewide resilience improvement program. You heard previously about the resilience action plan for the state highway system. That's a mouthful. In any event, this this is looking at multiple hazards, including flooding. We'll have a project list, and and the catalyst is states that have these plans can get a lower federal match requirement for protect funds, which are. Resilience Project Funds. Don't ask me to spell out the acronym. Ling, I know you're in the back. Is there any update you want to give us from Audubon? Hi, everyone. Thank you for your really helpful presentations today. Uh, Caitlin Newcamp with Audubon, Florida. I uh, just have a few points. Um, 
First, uh, we're supportive of the Central and Southern Florida Flood Resiliency Study as the first step to revitalize the CNSF infrastructure. We think it's very needed, and we attended the public workshop last month to discuss proposed performance metrics. While it was an engaging format with plenty of opportunity to share ideas and discuss project alternatives, Audubon was a bit disappointed to learn that the Corps is no longer looking at storage as a solution under the study. Storage is a vital part of an effective water infrastructure resiliency strategy. And with numerous challenges ahead, like many of you have mentioned, like sea level rise um, and increased storm events like we've seen uh, this past year, we ad advocate for the broad consideration of flood risk management in South Florida. And projects like the CNSF Flood Resiliency Study can help solve these immediate risks. So while it appears that this study is now solely focused on the primary system and coastal structures, we support expediting the project um, where possible, especially because the larger, more comprehensive study is many years away. Um, and then we also suggest um, inclusion of watershed storage in that comprehensive study. We think that would be really helpful. Um, in addition, we would just like to reiterate the need to consider compound flooding as a resiliency strategy. We know that this is when two different flood risks, such as storm surge and inland stormwater meet to worsen flooding than either would do alone. Um, and this has been identified in a hazard, as a hazard in the Collier County Storm Risk Management Feasibility Study by the Corps. Uh, however, it seems that they're unable to assess risk beyond coastal storm surge under this particular study, I think given its purview. But we still encourage the district, the core, and all these participating groups to incorporate managing compound flood risks as a robust mitigation strategy instead of just focusing on one alone because this is typically what happens in real life scenarios. And it will provide more protection for the public environment and our assets going forward. Uh, and then we want to also thank all of the participants within the South Florida Water Management District's jurisdiction that have participated in this year's greenhouse gas uh, inventory cohort that we hold. Those include Martin County, St. Lucie County, the city of Port St. Lucie, the city of Fort, Peace, Fort Pierce, and uh, nine other regions north of these areas. So we're really happy about that participation and these cohorts are about to close out their inventories so Audubon will continue to work with you all on them um, with the climate action planning associated with those. And then finally, we just greatly appreciate the continued collaboration that you all do with these forums specifically. Um, and we ask that we just continue to increase that collaboration, especially uh, with another group, the Southwest Florida Regional Resiliency Coalition. We think that incorporating them would strengthen cohesion and we are just grateful for um, these forums and looking at all the projects and are encouraged by the progress being made so far. Thank you. Excellent, thank you, Kaylee. Yes? I just, I just wanna say that as we work for community resilience that we have to remember that the people that will end up paying for this are each and every local resident and whether they're paying for it with local taxes or they're paying for it for their stormwater utility fee or their federal taxes, there's a lot of money that's going to be spent and there will be a point at which this community will not have the capacity to continue to go in that direction. Hey Stephanie, good to see you. Anything from the city of Miami? Um, thank you, first of all, for this forum. Um, I would say one of the main things I want to update this forum on is um, particularly when it comes into um, designating or talking about metrics um, as for environmental justice community status. Um, recently, the city of Miami has been working with the Army Corps of Engineers submitting our data sets um, that we have used uh, specifically within developing our Miami Forever carbon neutral plan. 
um, that we had used to designate um, specific neighborhoods within the city um, that uh, we have designated as environmental justice communities, but also the variables that we have used in order to um, identify, um, to, be, to be able to provide data on what we initially uh, announced as very qualitative. Um, initially, we have um, either, we have provided quantitative data or have used proxies you know, for um, our more qualitative aspects of it. Uh, we are continually working with the Army Corps, just ref refining the thresholds and updating that information. But, um, and we have provided that data not only for the city of Miami, but for the entirety of Miami-Dade County. Um, and uh, as far as integration, you know, uh, we hope that some of these metrics that we have used within the city to designate um, environmental justice communities can be applied um, across all um, Army Corps projects, you know, in order to be able to assist in identifying um, environmental justice communities. Excellent. Miami, I, I think we have two teams, maybe three teams from Miami, but anything from the emergency management team? I just want to take this opportunity to introduce myself and, and what I'm doing here. So my name is Chris Perez. I work out of the FEMA Region 4 Atlanta office in the Floodplain Management and Insurance Branch. I'm a uh, management and program analyst and also the Regional Flood Insurance Liaison. However, I'm here on a detail assignment embedded with Miami-Dade County uh, DEM. I've been here since September. I'll be here through March. One of the main tasks that we're working on is our flood response plan. I know some of you have been involved in that. Um, so that, that's my main task while I'm here, but also I'm here to provide technical support. Anything FEMA related in the mitigation realm, uh, please feel free to reach out. Uh, I'll be, like I said, embedded with the county through March, so please take advantage. I know uh, the Water Management District has, and we've been working together closely, so thank you. Thank you, Chris. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Um, minimal stuff uh, from emergency management, but I did just want to flag we have our quarterly LMS meeting coming up on December 14th. So if you guys are invited, we hope to see you there. If you're not and you would like to be involved, um, please reach out to Robin. He's your guy. He will hook you up. Um, and also, as part of that LMS committee, we are also going into a plan update year coming up. So, um, you know, I'm sure a lot of the resources, a lot of the tools and studies and things that have been presented here um, and the enhanced state hazard mitigation plan and the website, I think we're going to um, pull a lot of good information and inspiration from the things, the work that you guys are all doing. So looking forward to um, updating, doing our five-year plan update as we go into the new year. Nope. <laughs> okay, anything else? No, nope. no. Nope. Okay, I guess we're going to head to lunch. I'm just, I know everybody's hungry, and I'm going to give a little bit of wrap-up on homework uh, on when everybody's hangry, but just a refresher. So I promised that I was going to send um, um, an email asking for input that you might have with regards to the CR disease zones from FEMA. So I'm, I'm going to be compiling that and I'm going to be communicating with Rachel. So wait for that email. We are going to, this is one of the things we want your input. So if you have any comments or questions additional to what was presented here, let us know. I also going to send the NACO report that uh, Megan asked to share with you all on, on her um, table, round table presentation. And the, the report is really good, has great insights. Um, the third thing I'm going to send is input uh, for the USGS fluid sensors. I know we're going to go through the exercise of the elevations, uh, but it would be good to also get input on specific locations that we might want to have the two options that uh, USGS are presenting for us. I will provide details on that email as well. Um, the critical elevations list is the major, um, I would say, output of all this meeting. This focus discussions on flooding, I know, Menashe, you mentioned the focus on flooding here, but we also have other efforts, of course, on, on our ecosystem restorations, and we're going to be doing now a lot of that. But today, given those events, given the closing of the wet season, we, we understand that the flooding is really a major issue. If you read... And if you get a chance to go check on, on, on Kristen's plan, the profile for flooding is impressive. You, can, you get information. It's one of the highest risks that we have on the state, fully recognized there. So, I mean, there is a lot that we need to address in terms of flooding. So I'm glad we had this conversation here today. 
Um, and the, the final input that we want from you, two quick things, is uh, we're going to be sharing all the tools and the web maps from the information that Chris presented, so you're going to have full access. And as she said, input on that is also good. Those are products under construction. And we also want you all to fill the survey. We want input regards to the organization of this forum, to any other topics that we might want to see, to any comments that you have in general on things that we, we, you want us to do better. So we appreciate you all coming here. We appreciate your input. Wait for the follow-up emails. We are targeting to send you something before the end of this week. With that, have, let's eat. Thank you all.